Welcome everybody to the May 27, 2003 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, first item on our agenda, call to order. We'll do a quick roll call. Um, Jay Chapmas. Here. Uh, Joe Guglielmetti. Here. Jack Keneally. Here. Stephen LaPlante is absent. Gib Mendelson. Here. Michael Tranfaglia. Here. And David Backer. Here. Uh, for next item on the agenda was to approve the minutes of the April 22, 2003 meeting. Barbara, as I mentioned to you on the phone earlier today, I think the minutes are great. I have no comments. Does anybody else um, have comments or suggestions for changes on the minutes? Hearing none, could I have a motion to approve them as submitted? A motion, Mr. Guglielmetti, a second? Second. Second, Mr. Mendelson. Um, discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Um, we have two abstentions. Well, I wasn't here. Mr. Keneally and um, Mr. Tranfaglia. So the minutes are approved by a vote of three in favor, zero opposed, and show uh, Mr. Keneally and Mr. Tranfaglia as um, abstaining, since they were both absent from last month's meeting. Well, could we, Mr. Chair, could we back up the call to order? I, I should have told, said that uh, um, Steve Plant did call and said he'd be out of town. Uh, so, so excuse, okay. excuse his absence. Next item on our agenda is old business. Um, I'm not aware of any old business to take up, which brings us to new business. And the first item on our agenda under new business is a matter to hear the administrative appeal by Cross Hill, LLC of the Code Enforcement Officer's February 4, 2003 decision to withhold certificate of occupancies for lots 26 and 27 of tax map U58 and lots 20, 21, and 25 of tax map U59 until after the second floors are finished for use as additional bedrooms. And I understand, uh, Bruce, that this matter has been resolved by agreement and it is off our agenda. Yes, it is. We are speeding through this. Next item on our agenda is to hear the administrative appeal of Charles M. Sexton of the Code Enforcement Officer's April 11, 2003 denial of building permit number 030521 for a square foot dwelling on Sing property. Single family. Oh, single family, I'm sorry. Single family dwelling on property at 51 Woodland Road, tax map U01, lot 60. Is Mr. Sexton here or someone here on his behalf? No. Um, well, why don't we move on to the uh, next item and if Mr. Sexton comes, we'll hear his matter out of order. Um, Next item on the agenda is to hear the application of Brenda Simpson, 8 Susan Road, tax map U43, lot 36, for a conditional use permit to operate a home business. Is Brenda Simpson here or someone on her behalf? Ms. Simpson? Yes. My name is Teresa Simpson. I'm Teresa. Yes. Would you approach the podium? For us, please. All 
are you, are you expecting no, Brenda Simpson? They're both out of town, Brenda and Walter Simpson. I've asked, I've been asked by them to speak on their behalf. Okay, so you and answer are, questions and any questions that I can. So you are here as their representative. Yes. And uh, your address, please. My address is 70 Pike Street in Biddeford. Well, the floor is yours if you have any I've matters. never done this before. I don't know what you need to know from us in order for the application to be approved. Have you uh, reviewed the application that was submitted by Brenda Simpson on her behalf? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, if you don't have anything to present, I'll open it up to questions from the board. Mm -hmm. Um, and recognizing that you may or may not be able to answer all of the questions, um, we'll see where the application goes. Um, are, are you familiar with the with the road and the property and the business? Yes, I am. Do you work in the business? Not as a paid employee, no. I'm, I'm a member of the family. How familiar are you with the road that, um, Brent, is it Brenda and Edward Simpson? Is that who Edward's lived there? Edward's her son. Um, Walter is her husband. So it's Brenda and Walter who live yes. in the premises? Yes. I know that Susan Road is a, is a cul-de-sac. It's a dead-end road. Are you here to speak either in favor of or in opposition to the application? Yes. And would it be in favor of or in opposition to? In favor of. Okay, well, we'll, we'll give you an opportunity also then. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak either in support of or in opposition to this application? Okay. <clears throat> Well, I think at this point I'll open it up to the board for questions. Is there any inventory that's maintained on the premises? Yes, there is. And where, where would that be stored? We have a, in the basement, there's a, a room in the basement that we've dedicated to the um, supplies. And it's strictly a mail order business. We don't have a retail shop there. And how often uh, is this your is this your brother or? They're my in-laws that own the business. Uh, how often do they have deliveries? Once a day, the UPS um, delivery comes um, once per day, five days a week. And could you give us some sense of uh, the the amount of uh, storage space that this would take in the house? Um, according to the application, um, we ha we've dedicated about 12% 12, 12 of the house to um, storage facility and, you know, computer space and that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. If deliveries come once a day, how about outbound shipments as a mail order business? That's once a day as well. The UPS person comes to deliver any packages and picks up packages at the same time. So it's only one trip by UPS per day. Do you have any um, opinion as to the amount of daily traffic on Susan Road? You mean personal traffic? Total vehicular traffic that comes and goes down the road during the course of a day. When I've been there, I mean, there's, there's minimal traffic um, up and down the tr street during the day. So there are there are six houses 
with it that have driveways on Susan Road. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe the other, other gentleman who lives on the road would be in a better position to answer that question mm -hmm. you know, when he comes up, since you don't live there. I drove by the property yesterday or the day before, I forget which, mm -hmm. um, and the, um, the business apparently has a truck That's correct. Um, that was parked out on the road right next to um, the Simpsons' home. That's correct. Um, and it appeared that there were some pieces of flagpole that were sitting out mm -hmm. right on the edge of the property. That's correct. Next to the flagpole that they have erected. Mm -hmm. um, what would, what are those pieces of flagpole that we're laying out? Typically, um, when a flagpole gets delivered to us, that's actually just the casing that's around the flagpole. After the installation, we bring back the flagpole wrappings, we break it down and we take it to the recycling. We just haven't had a chance to do that yet. That's typically not what's there. Is there typically something there, but not that? Or do you mean that there's typically nothing that's there's, out there? There's usually nothing there, um, usually just the truck. And, and is the truck usually parked in the street? No, it's not. It's usually parked right where the, near the flagpole. In the driveway? Mm -hmm. Or on the street? In the driveway. In the uh, packet that was sent to members of the board, there was a newspaper article included in our packets. Are you familiar with this? Yes, I am. At all? Yes. Um, I didn't realize it was included in the packet. And there's a picture of, I guess, your in-laws and your husband? Yes, that's correct. And do you have any idea when this article was published? There's no, no I don't. It was, I, I believe it was just before the war occurred. Just before the Iraq war? Mm-hmm. Well, there's one uh, portion of this article that says, after the events of September 11, Simpson began getting calls for American flags from individuals. People were lined up outside her door in the weeks after the terrorist attack. Demand was so great that Simpson's company ran out of stock. And, sorry could not keep anything red, white, and blue on hand for weeks. Um, how often um, does the business sell flags out the door to individuals who actually come to the house? I could probably count them on one hand in the course of a year. Um, it's very unusual for people to come to the house because people don't recognize us as a place to buy residential flags. We deal primarily with commercial businesses. And from what I understand, when other flag companies were not able to give or sell flags, they were told to contact Allen Flag Company. Um, and I mean, that's, that's how that happened, the way I understood it. So that's, that's not a typical scenario at all. Okay. Other questions? How many trips are, are, what is your own truck, or their, their own truck used for? Is it used for deliveries to retail customers, or? No, the, the bucket truck that we have on the property is primarily for flagpole installations, um, because the, we need to, to transport the flagpoles. So it's, it's used primarily for transporting flagpoles as well as doing flagpole repair. How, how much of that do they do? 
unfortunately not enough i really can't speak to that but i know that the truck will sit idle for a long time for a long time you mean a week or a day or oh no it it sat for a couple of months at a time oh really so it tends to get used more in the springtime and in the summertime and maybe it'll go out once a week if maybe maybe once or twice per month i mean i i can't speak to that it varies i think one of the things that um i think david was getting information about was on this this traffic thing on your on their application uh there's a place for them to fill out current average daily traffic on the street did you see that do you have a copy of the application? Um, I'm not with me, but I, I am familiar okay. with the application. And their response was one truck. Uh, I think they're responding about their own traffic, but the intent of the question is to try to find out the total traffic on the street. Thank you. Um, I can't speak to that. I'm only there in the month of May. I can only speak to what the traffic looks like in the month of May. <clears throat> they're typically gone in the month of May. Okay. So. so the, the conditional use permit um, approval requires that the traffic increment associated with a home business like this not exceed 2% of the current traffic. And that's why that question is asked. That's why David was trying to get some sense of what the traffic is like on the street. Um, hmm. I can't really speak to that. I don't live there year round, so. If, if, there's one, if there's one truck visit per day, Mm -hmm. UPS. You don't have any FedEx trucks coming through. Nope. It's just UPS. It's just UPS. And that would say that there would have to be 50 vehicle visits to the street. Um, that's including people who live there and their cars are going to come back. Um, in order for the one truck to be 2% or less. Mm -hmm. Well, that's I think that's the objective of the questions that we've been. So is what you're saying is that unless there's more than 50 trips by vehicles per day, that it would have, it, you would have to have that in order for one UPS truck to, right. okay. Now, there's a rule of thumb which I'm somewhat familiar with and I forget the details and that is that traffic study engineers in a residential neighborhood, it usually attribute 10 vehicle, I think it's one-way trips, isn't it, Bruce? Is it 10 one-way trips? A vehicle trip is one, uh, once out and in. Okay, so it's 10 trips per uh, day. No, I mean, I'm sorry, once. Out and in is two vehicle trips. Right, that's right, exactly. <laughs> so 10, 10 vehicle trips per day per house is the statistical average figure they use when they're doing traffic studies. So that's like, that's actually five vehicle doing an in and out per day, right? So it's, right. Five round trips. Five round trips, right. right. How to keep it straight. <laughs> what? It's hard to, yeah. And so you're saying that on average, there are, per household, there should be <coughs> around five round trips. That's, that's, that's what the traffic engineers use as an average, and it's based on some large sample, I understand. Uh, it, may, it may not be true for your neighborhood, but since we don't have an exact count, and we don't tend to do an exact count, then we take that as a, some kind of a working example. Okay. So I think you have, I'm not sure about the two houses, um, on the corner, do they front on Susan Road or do they front on Fowler Road? I I thought they both fronted Fowler Road. At least that's where their front doors are was located. It, where the driveway is located? Off Susan or? Both their driveways are located off Susan. So then they would I, I, I think it's one of each, Jack. I think lot 31. Yeah. Um, right. And you can tell me, I think lot 31, the driveway is on Susan Road, and lot 30, is that a 38 or a 36? I'm going to have my glasses on. 38. 38, I believe, the driveway oh, fronts on Fowler Road. Okay. I believe there's six driveways total on Susan. I would count seven. Uh, well, this is a, a vacant lot. 
Okay. That, that corner piece, that triangular piece on the circle. Six. So, so we're correct that there are six driveways that, okay. that front on Susan Road. And we can have that confirmed by the other gentleman who's here also. Questions? Um, thanks for the clarification. I had the same question as Mr. Keneally on the, on the truck trips. But part of the application process requires a map um, of the home itself and what area the home is being dedicated. The application measures out 242 square feet, but um, okay. I guess for the application to be complete in my mind, I think we need some sort of a drawing uh, showing exactly where in the home in terms of, uh, you know, is that 242 just storage or is there, there's got to be some, I assume, a, a computer console someplace and filing and storage and there's one employee, I believe, in the application. Yes. So just sort of the, the whereabouts of where the, <clears throat> those people work in relationship to the volume of the home or the size of the home is kind of okay. important to my mind. So what you're, you're asking is that you need a map, yes. a drawing of the house and kind of a layout. I have another question along that line. Uh, how, how old is the business itself? 11 years. 11 years in the business. Mm -hmm. So would you say at this time it's pretty well maximized potential in this house? I think it's like, to, uh, moving to this question, uh, as far as the, would there be any foreseeable expansion or probably maxed out as far as inventory uh, area. In other words, will you have more increased trips in the future, or where are they in the in building this business? Mm -hmm. It has been there 11 years. I would assume that it's pretty mature. Mm -hmm. Or conversely, with current current events, it may even be booming. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question would be, uh, where is it headed? What are some of the plans for the future? Are they just going to stay as they are? Um, with the current uh, rate of travel and, uh, and mail order volume. Mm -hmm. That's a question that I would have of them, or maybe if you could answer that. Well, I know that in the last couple of years, um, business has really grown. Um, and we have discussed at some point whether or not it makes sense to keep running it out of the house. Um, and of course, not being someone who run, owns the business or runs the business, it's hard for me to kind of speak to that any further without saying things I'm not supposed to say. But uh, <laughs> I know for me personally, I, 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 um, I would have to pose that to them as a question as well. well. It could be a question, because at some point it no longer becomes a residence. Mm -hmm. you know, the volume of dedicated to the inventory and shipping or whatever you do overwhelms the, the residence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I can, I can, tell the board that without the article, uh, probably wouldn't know the business was there. So it's been pretty low key for mm -hmm. a long time, not that there's anything to do with it, but mm -hmm. um, that probably speaks well for the fact that it blends in the neighborhood. I have a couple of questions, please. Uh, Do you know what precipitated the uh, Simpsons to apply for a permit at this time? Um, yes. <laughs> we got a letter in the mail. <laughs> actually, um, the Simpsons were actually out on vacation, and we got a certified letter. Um, I'm not exactly sure. From the, I know it was from the code enforcement officer. OK, that was you. <laughs> we got a certified letter saying that the application had never been submitted. And so my husband and I called. Brenda Simpson, and we did the application with her over the phone and sent it in. Um, so how how you came to send us a letter? I don't. Oh, it's the article in the paper. Uh, the paper. <laughs> that's how that's how the application came to be. Have the Simpsons had, so that they've been away for some time? Do they spend time away? Yes, they go away every May. Okay. 
Uh, referring to an earlier question about the article where it did reference that people were come to the door. Do you know how they knew where to come when it said there were people lined up the door? And you said that rarely happens, and I understand that. Do you, would you? As far as I know, what we heard from people who were coming in saying, oh, well, we called such and such company, and they said that you still had flags, and they told us how to come here. Um, Do you know in the phone directory it, it's listed as Allen Flag? Is that correct? Um, I believe it is listed as Allen Flag. And do you know if is an address given under the business section? You know, I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know that. Okay. Uh, Have, do you, some of these questions may be unfair to you to, to ask, but have you heard whether retail sales have ever been anticipated in the future? Not at that location, no. Retail sales in general, it wouldn't be from there. Uh, Regarding the flag truck, when I drove by there today, it was not parked in the driveway, it was parked on the grass. Uh, is, that, is that a typical place where it's parked? It, and it seemed to be uh, on the far side of the flag, erected flagpole. It was, or maybe it was adjacent to the flagpole, but it was parallel parked to the street, where earlier you said that it was typically parked in the driveway. Um, I don't know where the truck is parked today. And when I left this morning, the truck was still parked in the road, so my husband may have moved it. I don't know where he parked it now. How many external or outside employees are there for the business? Um, my husband, Ed, is the only paid employee. Say again? My husband, Edward, is the only paid employee. Okay, and he's the only employee? Yes. And he lives in Biddeford? Yes. Okay. Uh, who drives the, the bucket truck? Edward does. He does? Mm hmm Okay, and he comes to the location, the office, every day? Yes. Okay. Uh, that raises uh, another question regarding uh, the bucket <coughs> truck. How does it, how often does it erect flag poles. How often does it leave the business? Would you guess daily? No. No, as I answered earlier, sometimes it can stay parked for a couple of months and not get used. It typically gets used more in the springtime when people are installing flag poles. Okay. And at that point, it may leave once or twice a week, and then other times it won't leave at all for weeks on end. So in some weeks, it leaves once or twice mm -hmm. out of the five-day period. Uh, then would you say that it's, as far as number of trips, vehicular trips per day, related to the business, uh, you say the UPS truck comes once a day, well, that's two trips. Your mm -hmm. husband comes once a day, that has to be counted as two more trips. And on the odd weeks where the truck does come and go, uh, that's at least on that day that would be two more trips for a total of six trips on that day uh, When the truck does come and go does it Go out one time and come in one time Or does it go to one site come back and get another flight pole and go to another site? Maybe you can't answer these no. it, I, it all depends because I mean you can only transport so many flag poles in one one trip so at least on some days it appears that there could be six employee-related trips. Mm -hmm. UPS to your husband, the single employee to, and, and the bucket truck, two more. And on the days that the bucket truck does not uh, do its business, then it's at least four trips per day, five days a week. Okay. Is that we, correct? We actually haven't factored in my husband's commute in and out of work. So... Uh, as part of the travel. That is, and it does number of trips per day that the home business will generate. I, it appears to me that that has to be counted as part of the home business. If there was no home business, then your husband wouldn't go to and from 
that location every day. He might. They're his parents. He could. Okay. Uh, from Biddeford, though, that might be unlikely, I would guess. No. He's visited them multiple times during the week. Okay. Well, they, the, the application does state that there is one, empl one person employed who is not a resident. That's correct. And, and with that statement being made on the application, we would have to assume that that employee mm -hmm. drives to the job location okay. on a daily basis. Okay. Uh, and when your husband is not driving the truck, he's working in the business, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And would you, how many hours per day would you guess that he at, is at the business? He's usually there for about eight hours a day. Eight hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's, it's a full day every day. Does he ever come on weekends for job-related business? He tries not to. <laughs> Typically, no. And uh, do you, have you heard the symptoms discussing, you, you mentioned that the business was growing, ever expanding to an outside location for the job site, for their business location. Has this been discussed that it you were been. aware of? Yes. And again, you may not know the answer mm -hmm. to these. It would be nice if the Simpsons could answer these directly. And so I apologize for asking questions that you may not know. Oh, that's but, okay. No, it has been discussed. And do you know? Is there any time frame related to that? Has it just no time frame? It's it's just in the discussion stages at this point. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for Ms. Simpson? Thank you, Ms. Simpson. Thank you. And if you'd like to step up to the podium for us, please. And if you would give us your name and address, please. My name is David D'Alessandre, and my address is 7 Susan Road. And would you spell your last name, Mr. D'Alessandro, so we get it right in the minutes? Yes, sir. D-A-L-E-S-S-A-N-D-R-I. D-R? D-R-I. I. And you wanted to speak in favor of the application? Yes, I, I, I did. I received the letter in the mail, uh, as I'm sure all the neighbors did, saying that there was going to be this meeting here tonight discussing this matter. And um, uh, I felt kind of obligated to come and speak on, uh, on behalf of, uh, of the Simpsons, because uh, I live directly across the street from them. And um, their business, uh, in no way really impacts the neighborhood in a negative manner as far as um, as far as I've experienced you know and I think it's kind of nice to have somebody selling flags here in town actually and I don't really know what else more I'm supposed to say <laughs> but if you have any questions for me uh, I'd be happy to answer them to the best of my ability. You know, I, I think that you probably are the natural person to answer a question that's been asked or referred to a few different times, and that is what the um, average traffic is on the street each day. Um, well, I know I go in and out, you know, sometimes more than others. Uh, of course, you know, some, some days, or some weeks anyways, I'll, I'll be gone for three or four days. Other times I'll be in and out of the house, um, you know, four or five times during the day. 
um, depending on the number of errands and things that I have to do. Um, I know uh, next door to the right of me uh, is a mother with two daughters, and so she uh, typically, you know, brings the kids to school, picks them up from school, um, and has um, you know daily errands to do as well. So. I mean, there's, there's definitely there's definitely traffic there. I mean, it was interesting to hear about that ten trips per day per household is kind of what you what you figure. Yeah. Well, at least as uh, Mr. Keneally referenced, um, that appears to be what the traffic study engineers find <coughs> to be a general to be an average for a residence. Mm -hmm. Five round trips for each residents or which equates to what they call 10 vehicle trips. A vehicle trip is a one way. So you drive out to the grocery store, come back, you've made two vehicle trips. Yeah. Sir, I understand. Okay. So there's, um, yeah. I know, I mean, I myself can create a lot of traffic. I have three vehicles, so I am uh, driving quite a bit. Well, do you, uh, do you dare venture an estimate for us as to what the uh, number of vehicle trips are per day on Susan Road? Well, like I said, I myself, I have three vehicles. I know the neighbor, she only has the one. And there's, some other, there's another neighbor, it's a husband and wife, and they have two vehicles. And then, um, and then there's the road, the, the house up on the, uh, the front's on Fowler Road, but the driveway is on Susan. I know they have two vehicles and, uh, and a teenage daughter, I believe, so, I mean, there's, I'm just trying to count the number of actual drivers that are on the road. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's just probably a solid eight drivers that live on the road that make regular trips. So if that was 10 a day, then that's on the average of 80. So say, I think it would be safe to say anywhere between 16 and 80 vehicle trips a day. That would be my answer. That's as, that's as finite as I can get. Yeah, and I realize you're, 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 making, you're making an educated guess for us. Yes, sir. But since you're the only resident of Susan Road who's here, yeah. you're the one I'm who gets to field the question. I'm kind of facto expert, I guess. <laughs> It seems like that's what it's coming down to, is the number of vehicle trips. Other questions from the board? How long have you been uh, a neighbor of Susan Road? Uh, I moved in onto Susan Road on um, September 15th, 2001, so not quite two years. In, in that period of time, have you uh, in your comings and goings, have you noticed any increase in, in traffic uh, to the Simpsons' house? No, sir. No, sir. Uh, like, like she stated, you know, very rarely do they have ever have any customers actually come to the to their to their home. Um, I was kind of amused to hear that they had people lined out the door because I've never seen. Uh, any line coming out of the Simpsons' home um, at all. Uh, I think, uh, you know, in the time that I've lived there, I've maybe actually seen probably two customers come to the house in the last two years. So, so, so perhaps the, uh, the report in the newspaper could have been just a uh, literary license? Yeah, I think it was more of a figure of speech than an actuality. Thank you. 
Other questions? Uh, how many children live on, in that neighborhood, that street? Do you, could you guess? Um, Currently. I believe there's a, I would say four. Thank you. Four, sir. Anything else, Dr. Chetness? Thank you, sir. Very well. I appreciate it. Um, there is no one else here to speak in favor or in opposition to the Simpsons application, correct? Okay, that will close the public comment portion of the hearing and it will open it for board discussion. Mr. Becker, if I may. You may, Mr. Tranfaglia. Um, <clears throat> boy, it's sort of like being against uh, your grandmother apple pie, but um, I'm all for the, the flag business. <clears throat> I think the problem is, is that the business has been in operation for 11 years. So I don't think the, the traffic patterns, I mean, the, the traffic is not a major issue to me. I think it's been pre-existing for a while. <clears throat> um, however, now that uh, the business has been sort of become more public uh, by the ordinance. They do need to have a conditional use permit, but I'm having trouble reconciling that because of the definition of a home business. And I don't have trouble with the, the traffic, but I do have trouble with the square footage occupied by the business. And the fact that there were flagpoles, you know, on, on one occasion that were outside. Um, this definition also states should be no outdoor storage of equipment or materials. Um, so I guess I still think, like, my feeling is I think the application is incomplete without a map. I would like to see exactly what, what uh, percentage of the real estate outside, inside is being used to do the home business. Um, well, none can be used outside. By I'm sorry, Bruce, what did you say? I said none can be used outside. Can't be outside storage of materials, so. Or equipment. Or equipment. Well, one question, and those are good points, <laughs> Mr. Tranfaglia. One question that, that obviously has come to the forefront of the minds of all of us up here is the question of traffic count and whether the business meets the 2% um, limitation of the ordinance definition. Another question is whether or not the truck is considered equipment where the ordinance says that there shall be no outdoor storage of equipment or materials. Is the truck business equipment? Obviously, somebody who drives a truck or works for a sign business or a plumbing business or an electrical business or anything else for that matter, and they drive their truck home at night, they're allowed to do that. And they can either park it on the street in front of their house or they can park it in their driveway. They're not running a home business. They're entitled to do that. But the question is for a home business, um, is the truck equipment and can it be stored outside? I mean, the pieces of flagpole, I think, are clearly materials, and they're not supposed to be in the yard. But I'd raise the question as to whether or not, if you have a home business, you're allowed to leave a vehicle outside. I don't know whether the truck can be parked inside. I really didn't consider that when I drove by the business and to see whether it could even be put in the garage. There is no garage. There is no garage. Okay, thank you. Ms. Simpson just informed us that there is no garage. I can, I can tell you that, that from the last application that we had for a home business, uh, as a result that we're revisiting the definition, 
the traffic count, and we'll put it, we'll recommend that that ordinance section be changed to allow 10 vehicle trips per day uh, for any home business. That is being considered as a change to the ordinance? Yes. Because in, inherently this can be a problem on a road with with, with only a few houses. Few houses. And it's never really been an issue until now, and it is an issue. So there is a change coming, a good chance. I know that doesn't help you tonight, but I thought I'd share that with the board. So instead of a percentage, it'll be a, a definite count, an flat, absolute count. Flat 10, 10 bill trips a day for any home business. What? Is that what? one-way trips or run trips? Or? No, that's... Uh, vehicle trips. Okay, if you want a retail business, you'd be restricted to five customers. Five round trips. Okay. Five round trips. Oh. What stage is, is that club, that change in? It's, it's just being looked at now. Is that a state change or a town change? Or? Town. That would be a town ordinance change. I, I, the, tra the traffic I can... Traffic here is, is pretty marginal. If you, if, you, if you graciously say that the son might be visiting his parents once a day anyway, so I sat out, and you have only the UPS trucks. And you, if you look at the fact that you have um, six driveways and five vehicle trips per day, if you take that over seven days, and per week, you have 210 um, vehicle trips per week. 2% um, of that, four vehicle, these are round trips now, four vehicle round trips per week. So if the UPS family comes four to five days, they don't, UPS doesn't deliver on Saturdays, I believe, well, my area anyway. So if it's, and he only comes four out of five days, then you're right at the 2% figure. That's not a, perhaps a big issue here. Well, and even if we accept uh, Mr. Delazandri, Mr. Delazandri's estimate of 60 to 80 vehicle trips per day, then we're still within the 2%, even if the UPS truck delivers every day. And again, as you say, being generous to the son that he might right. visit his parents right. anyway during the week. Right. But what I hear Bruce saying is, is that that's but something that we should be lenient on, recognizing the fact that a change seems to be in the works. I just thought I'd share. I don't know. No, and thank you. I think it's important that we know that. Truck that's a, not, you mentioned the case of an electrician's truck where he's going out and coming in, he might store that, but this is a different category of truck, isn't it, where it's only used for installations? Well, plumbers, electricians, and all those who bring their vehicles at home is a little bit different than having a business in a home. If that same electrician, or let's use a carpenter for an example, if, he, if it was a carpenter, would had a carpenter shop? Right. at his residence, then I would think, you know, you, it would be different than a carpenter who does work outside. Same thing goes that if a carpenter has an office and comes to this board for a home business, the off he'd have a permit for a home business office to support a carpentry business that's off-site. Right. So, I mean, that's, that's the difference, and that's always a it's always a gray area, and you know we don't we don't ask people to come to the to the board for get additional use permit unless we know there's an office or they want an office. So we allow electricians and plumbers and and the like to to park their vehicles in their own yard at night, unless it's associated directly with a the business. Right. Then I'm not sure how. You know, if we're going to allow that, would would we consider a truck a, 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 a part of the equipment? I mean, when when is it when is it considered? Is it when it's not doesn't have any writing on it, or when it does? 
yeah. you know, if a truck didn't have anything to indicate that it was part of the business, then then maybe that's where you draw the line. I don't know. We never had this discussion whether vehicles were <coughs> were part of the equipment. Well, the electrician's truck might be considered one of his regular personal vehicles too. He may use it for a lot of personal transportation as well as his, his business. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to get the bucket truck into that same category. Well, I mean, you could you could simply um, make make the finding that that uh, a vehicle is not a piece of equipment. That things related to the business that's separate from a vehicle, and that would eliminate the flagpoles and cement mixes and all the things that may be put in the yard as part of the business. I don't know. Well, what's the board's uh, sentiment on making the determination that that an equip that um, that a vehicle is not business equipment? <coughs> Mr. Well, Mendelson, were you in the, uh, the the sign business at one time? Unhappily so. <laughs> did you have any? Uh, did you have vehicles? Many. Did you consider those business equipment? Absolutely. That's what I was afraid you were going to say. Uh, yeah, I, I think it would be uh, uh, would be bootstrapping here to pretend that this vehicle was was not equipment attendant to the to this business. Um, clearly, the uh, Miss Miss Simpson Miss Simpson indicated that it was used in the business. Um, it's highly unlikely that someone would own a bucket truck, particularly one that is used as rarely as this one apparently is, unless they had some business purpose for, for a use other than personal use. But I think that um, uh, as I drive around this town, um, I see numerous vehicles uh, parked in, in people's driveways, uh, parked on the, on, on the side of the driveways overnight. Um, that, that are obviously related to some business purpose. It may not be necessarily a home business, but it is, clearly has some, some relationship with some business. Um, in addition, it seems to me that we, we do have uh, the ability to, if, if, if we wanted to, to impose an obligation for them to remove the, the truck from, from uh, uh, their, their, uh, their home. Now, on the days that the truck is needed, I suppose um, Edward could drive the truck to the business. And um, other times, leave the bucket truck at his home in Biddeford. He wouldn't be operating a home business out of his home in Biddeford. He'd be tr taking the uh, company vehicle truck home, which is an option. It's only driven once a week or sometimes once a month anyway. Wouldn't be very often that he would have to drive the bucket truck <coughs> to the office. Mr. Mendelson's comment that he had many sign trucks bothers me a little because if you consider not one truck being equipment, then would you consider 10? I mean, where do you, where do you draw the line? Certainly you wouldn't want 10 trucks parked in a residential neighborhood. So if you didn't consider it equipment, so I think right. you probably have to. Yeah, I'm, I, I asked the question of him <laughs> what the answer was likely to be. I think if you were to look at any business financial statement, any business uh, listing of assets and liabilities, the vehicles are going to be listed under equipment. Right. Um, I think from an accounting standpoint, absolutely, vehicles are equipment. So. 
Are we ready to move forward? Further discussion? I have a question. How, if a conditional use permit is denied, what are reapplication procedures and time frame? I didn't bring the book with me, but I don't think you can come with the same application because, you know, again, I mean, it could, but it would have to be denied on the same merits. Unless something in the audience changed to to allow something different. If a traffic count is requested, who orders that and and could you outline when that takes place and how rapidly that would take place? For well, the the, uh, the applicant would have to would have to hire a traffic specialist to do that count and and then resubmit uh, submit the the uh, uh, count to the board. Is the I think, board I think you maybe be able to table it so this other <laughs> the uh, new change could come about ordering a traffic count I don't know well I, it it appears to me that there this is in in my mind and all as many aspects this application is completely different from other similar type applications that we've had. Uh, road width, turnaround, neighborhood accessibility, their uh, duration of visits, there are a number of factors uh, that, that make this application stand out from prior applications of a similar type. Uh, I think in one aspect that the business has been in business for 11 years, and evidently it's been low key enough that neighbors and others have not either noticed or cared or been bothered, uh, is, is significant. From a traffic count standpoint, using the 2% rule, I don't see that this applies. Uh, I mean, that from a technical standpoint, it appears in my mind, without a, a traffic count, that this does not meet criteria. But looking at an overall standpoint, I think one thing you could take away from this is, if you want to operate a home business, make sure you don't live on a short, dead-end street because the percentages work against you in, in that aspect. Uh, so if there is a pending rule change, then, then you know, that could be a, a relevant factor in this case. Uh, I wouldn't be opposed to order, requesting a traffic count to support this application. Uh, viable option for the board to consider. Uh, realizing that the, that the, uh, there may be a change, could the board table this pending that change? Uh, would that be something that could entertain? My feelings are not to proceed with the decision on this motion this evening, because I think what we're trying to do What's different about this application is we're trying to retroactively fit. I don't think anybody here doesn't want the business to continue, but we're trying to fit it into an existing ordinance of conditional use. The conditional use ordinance is basically starting out, I'm going to start my business tomorrow, so it's asking questions about traffic, it's asking questions about impact on the environment uh, predominantly. This business has been going on there for 11 years. I mean, I think it's going to be difficult to find out. I mean, the true traffic pattern there is their business. Um, 
Uh, so to me, that's not an issue, nor is um, environmental impact. However, one of the questions that's very objective is, and I still think the application, the reason why it should be tabled, it's incomplete. The, one of the findings of facts we have to discuss is, is the proposed site plan and layout uh, compatible with adjacent uh, property uses in the comprehensive plan. And to me, that is the layout is the map with um, uh, total percentage outside of what's written down in the application. I'd like to see how much of that real estate is being used for, for land. We had some flagpoles which normally are not kept outside, but they were kept outside on, on one drive-by visit. How much of the land is being used? And, and, and I think maybe with a little bit of homework, we'll be able to uh, fit the business into the ordinance. But I think trying to proceed this evening, I don't know how we can, <clears throat> how we can make a decision, whether favorable or, or not. Well, I read the, uh, the element dealing with proposed site plan and layout as something that affects the external use of the property. And this is not a business that uses any portion of the external part of the property. It's whatever they use inside to store materials and have a little home office. Um, they've told us that they're using about 12%. Um, they're not allowed to store anything outside. I mean, it's one of the one of the elements of a home business. Element number seven says there shall be no outdoor storage of equipment or materials, and that will have to be a condition of anything we do. Actually, it's not even it's not even a an optional condition. It's a mandate. If you're going to have a home business, you can't store pieces of flagpole outside. Uh, we can add it as a condition, but whether we add it or not, it's, it's, it's prohibited. But I don't, I guess I see the, the site plan and layout as really not applicable at all to this application. <coughs> Inside the house, I mean, only 20%, is that right? The 20% 20% of the floor plan. Now, the UPS truck is coming every day and delivering something, and they don't have a garage, and it's being put somewhere. Uh, I guess. My way of thinking is how much of the volume inside the house is being used for the business. If it can be demonstrated that it's less than 20 percent, then uh, you know provisions can be made for not keeping business women outside. But without knowing that, I well, I guess my point is, short of a site visit, a personal inspection by you, <laughs> um, with them providing us with a floor plan and saying, and marking off and saying, this is the 200 and some odd square foot portion that we use, uh, which they've told us in the application. Um, I, you know, we sort of have to take them at their word that they're being um, straightforward with us on the amount that's being used. And we don't have any way to know otherwise because all we can do is do a, is do a drive by, not a walk through. Mm -hmm. uh, but other applications come to us with the map showing us this is my study and this is where my desk is and where my one employee is going to be sitting. Um, and we always request a map of, of the house and what's, where they're doing business. We don't, and I think it's, I think we're making another exception in this particular case to proceed without a, a map that's part of the application process, even if it's a mortgage uh, lenders map and, and so they pay, you know, check in area where they're doing business. Well, if, if the board thinks that's an yeah. important element, then, you know, yeah. then it shouldn't be considered without that. That does raise a question of, if, since there is no garage, uh, how many flagpoles are on site at once and how long do they remain on site before installation? And if they're stored inside, how many flagpoles can you store in the house? What's the smallest breakdown size, for example? I, I, I don't know that these questions can be answered by anyone but the, <coughs> but the petitioning party. But that's also a relevant question as far as storage. Uh, I can't imagine that flagpoles would be delivered, I guess I could imagine, but flagpoles be delivered and installed on the same day. 
I mean, possibly that happens, but that's certainly the, the definition of real-time inventory to do that. And, and, and if there is no outside storage and there is no garage to store them in, outside storage not being permitted and no garage to store them in, that would, can envision it be difficult to store a flagpole in your house prior to installation. No. Well, we could probably get an answer to that from uh, Ms. Simpson. Uh, would you like to address, come, up, come back up and address the issue, issue of flagpole storage for us? Um, typically, flagpoles are not installed the same day. Um, they're typically 30-foot flagpoles. Um, and they're usually with, installed within a week of delivery. Um, we don't like them sitting around or customers having to wait. So they're usually installed within a week. Where are those stored for that week, would you? Right on the lawn, unfortunately. And sometimes it's put underneath the deck in the back. So. But if, if we started approaching this with restrictions. Could we request that flagpoles not be delivered to the, to the site? Could they be delivered to the job site, for example? Could, could the bucket truck be, in, indeed, you certainly see mm -hmm. uh, service type trucks around town and in driveways and going to the grocery store. I don't know if that I've seen a, a, a bucket truck going to the grocery store. I, I think you would put that in a pure, equipment category. Uh, I mean, it'd be had hard to use that as an around-the-town vehicle compared to, a, a, you know, a, a van, a delivery truck or, uh, that you would park, electrical or other type of service truck. Could that be parked off-site? Uh, could, could issues like this be addressed without adversely affecting the, the, the I'm sure we I'm sure we could find some solution to that um, I don't I don't see there be any um, reason not to because it appears that that there are technical guidelines that have to be followed excuse me technical guidelines of the ordinance that that that, that we have to respect mm -hmm. oh I understand that I think we could make adjustments, you know, parking the, the truck elsewhere and finding a way to have those those poles delivered directly to our customers. Are there other questions? It's not so much a mess. You understand it's not a matter of the poles being delivered directly to your customers. It's a matter of exterior storage for mm -hmm. yes. for our home business. Mm -hmm. Is it 30 foot poles typically? Yes. So they don't fit in a basement door and be able to run the length of the basement. Well, we haven't tried it. I'm, I'm assuming we could give it a try, but we haven't tried that one yet. I think the, the one of the intents of the ordinance that governs this is that that kind of material um, not be visible, you know, as. Mm -hmm. In, in a residential neighborhood, so I, I would be willing to go along with a condition that requires that it be stored out back beneath the deck, out of sight, so uh, visitors on the street, and that's really the intention of the ordinance. Um, residential property and not take on the look of commercial property because of storage of materials inside. anything else? I don't think so. Okay. It's not yet. We'll <laughs> yeah. call you back. If All right. Thanks. I, I, um, I, I wonder whether we might consider holding off final determination on this until next month, until the business owners are actually able to come to a meeting and respond to some questions from the board. Is there a desire to table further consideration of this until the uh, owners of the business can appear before the board? 
Well, it's unfair to the applicant if indeed one or more of the elements won't be met. It's unfair to just table it. I mean, I think we ought to address it if, if, if there is something that can't be met here. Um, there's no sense to send the applicant away if that's the case. You, don't, you can't postpone an inevitable. Well, I can say that if I was to vote on it this evening, I would vote in favor of the application with the condition that there be no outdoor storage of equipment or materials, including the truck. Um, I'm not, I, I guess technically I'm, you know, I'm looking at the 2% rule and I realize that we're marginal on that, but the explanation that the reasoning that Mr. Keneally provided, I think is reasonable. Um, and when tied to the 60 to 80 vehicle trips per day estimated uh, by Mr. D'Alexandri, I think we're within the 2%. Um, I'm more concerned about the truck and the outdoor storage, but that can be met as a matter of... And we heard from the applicant's representative that that, that would be conditions that they could work with, so... I mean, they either have to meet it or they have to... Right not run the business out of the home. So I'm, I, I don't know, Jack, what you'd be looking for beyond that. I think, you know, if, if indeed it meets the conditions. Um. Well, because the representative is not a business owner or, or, or a manager of the business. Um, I hesitate to ask her to make commitments um, on their behalf that she may not really be fully authorized to make. Well, she really wouldn't be. I mean, the owners would either have to meet the obligation of not storing their vehicle or equipment or any other conditions that, one, right. that would be imposed, or they operate the business elsewhere. I mean, we have spent an hour and 15 minutes on this discussion, and I, I just hate to, to have that go down the tube because we'll start all over again the next meeting and have another hour and 15 minutes or more. And, because you'll, you'll want to make sure everything is right, and I appreciate that, but if we've got to a point where we can agree that the conditions are met, uh, the, the ordinance are met, and there's conditions that, that can be imposed that everybody's willing to work with, then I, I would ask the board to proceed forward. I think one of my concerns is, it goes back to something that you told us as a board before, and that is that we put these conditions on, and then the burden falls to you to make sure that they're met. And it's hard for you to do that, and I'd rather. Well, no, no, it's not. It, when you when you when you put a condition that you, you that you approve a farm porch that only can have screens, that's the kind of stuff that I really don't want to monitor 20 years down the road. But when it comes to a business, it's it's pretty easy to go back to the approval and say yes, they're in compliance, or no, they're not. Uh, business is a little different than a variance that you may put restrictions on that could get lost in the, by the wayside. Okay, as long as you're comfortable with, with enforcing it. The restrictions that I would, if, if it's agreeable to the board, I would like to see imposed upon this is, is that the bucket truck not be parked on site in the neighborhood. Uh, no outside storage of equipment or materials. There'd be no retail sales, no counter sales, over-the-counter sales through the front door sale, and uh, no sign. Uh, all of these would directly address the provision in the ordinance that, that the home business does <coughs> not detract from the neighbor re residential character of the neighborhood. Uh, well, the home business may have a sign, I believe, it has to comply with the sign ordinance. So I don't think that we should. But there are no retail sales. I think it goes hand in hand. That, that well, if this 10 vehicle trip per day uh, restriction comes into being, then that would allow a very small number of, of retail calls. And so, I, again, for that reason, I don't think we want to specify exclusion of that possibility. Yeah, but I think the, the potential for retail sales can escalate quite quickly and dramatically over a mail order catalog. I mean, I, oh, I realize that, but, but they still have to stay within this new limitation of 10 vehicle trips per day, which might be one or two customers in addition to whatever other traffic they have. I'm not trying to nurture, you know, uh, 
All I'm saying is I don't believe that we ought to put a condition in relating to retail business. I'm not saying we ought to try to encourage it, but I don't think that it's appropriate for us to put an exclusion in. Well, you know, actually, the, this whole line of question that you've raised, Mr. Keneally, raises a, another question in my mind. The application states that this is a mail order business. A mail order business, to me, seems inconsistent with having a bucket truck to ever do an installation as opposed to shipping product out to people. Mail order seems to be inconsistent with an actual installation process. It becomes a service at that point, a service business. Ms. Simpson, maybe you better come back up for one, <laughs> one more time at the podium to explain the the mail order business aspect of it and what the, how the bucket truck ties in with a mail order business. I will do my best. <laughs> um, primarily the, the, the bulk of our orders comes in through mail, fax, and phone orders. Um, occasionally we will have customers that will call us and ask if we have um, flagpoles and can install flagpoles. Um, the orders for flagpoles come by phone. Um, or by fax, and that's how we got into installing flagpoles, and that's why we need a truck. So the mail order aspect of the business is mail order, mailing, delivering flags only. Yes. Is that right? Yes. You don't, people don't mail order a flag pole, or do they? We, we do ship six foot poles and eight foot poles. We do ship those, but we install 25 foot poles and 30 foot poles. Could you give me some sense of what percentage of the business, uh, dollar volume-wise, um, these large flag poles represent? I, I don't, I can't give you a percentage, but I do know that, because um, my husband and I are the ones who do the installations, um, and I think the most we've ever done in one season has been six flag poles in a spring season. <clears throat> so. Did you say six? Yes, and actually five of them were delivered to the customer out in Belfast. How long is the, the bucket truck been involved? <coughs> Excuse me? How long has the bucket truck been involved in, in the 11-year business? Um, I think it's been around for two years. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, it's time. We. You either decide that you want to table it for something further next month, and you're welcome to do that, and I won't be here for that. Um, or we go ahead and approve it up or down uh, tonight with conditions. I would uh, opt for proceeding with conditions. Okay. So let's talk about conditions. Um, we've heard... Um, no uh, business vehicle stored outside, no outdoor storage of other materials and equipment. We've heard a proposal for no signage and for no walk-up traffic. My concern with the retail or walk-up traffic is that it's professed to be a mail order business and we should address it as such. Uh, if, if they do have walk-up business, do they tell the fourth customer to go away? I mean, it, it's to me, I don't see how you can restrict it to three customers a day. Uh, it, it either is a walk-up business or it isn't. And this is, this is a application clearly states mail order business. So I think we should address and restrict it as such as might be. Well, I'm personally comfortable with that as a condition. And since there is no retail 
provision since it is mail order and as she stated through mail, fax, and telephone, I would see no need for signage at that point either. Uh, in an effort to preserve the residential flavor of the neighborhood would be my concern. Any other conditions or comments on those conditions? Um, I could live with them. I think they're somewhat over restrictive. I mean, again, the business has been in, in place for 11 years. Um, and neighbor has testified that in recollection, maybe two visits in the past. I mean, so now, now if someone knocks on the door and says, you know, the, the one or two people here, I want to buy a flag, are they, with this restriction, do they have to be sent away? I, mean, it doesn't, I, don't, I don't think the, the volume is high enough that it really is an issue. And I, I like what Mr. Keneally said about the outside storage. I mean, I think the intent is not to grant outside storage, but if things can be concealed uh, under a deck in the backyard and you know, five feet of the flagpole is exposed, I don't consider that outside. I, I, I hope the restriction outside storage isn't so restrictive that they can't make a, a workable solution to that with the volume that they're doing. I, I think the spirit of that was not to be so that when you're walking by outside or looking out your kitchen window, it looks like there's a commercial industry next door. And if, if things can be... Uh... I, I don't really think the board has a choice. It says no outside storage, period. If you've got a storage area that's under a deck, then it has to be considered part of the 20 percent. It's closed in. Uh, so, I mean, I think the audit speaks for itself. You can make a condition if you want, but it doesn't make any difference. If there's outside storage and I see it, then it's going to have to stop. I, you know, I don't think it's a, it makes no difference whether you make a condition or not. It's, it's already part of the ordinance. Okay. Stating that there's no outside storage, is that correct? I mean, you can certainly do that. I no, mean, the, the ordinance, the ordinance that. already says that. So, I mean, it, it's, already, it's already there. It's how, do, how do you feel about the equipment and the truck falling and truck falls under the label of equipment and as far as the I, Yeah, I believe it does. Okay. So, the ordinance as it stands and already, uh, already disqualifies both that material storage and the bucket truck being but, part of yeah. But I think that the, your point's well taken, but... Uh, Mr. Back earlier said he drove by and saw flight poles in the yard. So they were unloaded there. They weren't stored there, but they were certainly present there. And I think that our intent was to preclude delivery, <coughs> which would be off the UPS truck storage for up to one week, as, as the representative stated, and then put back onto the bucket truck for final site delivery. And that I see that as a, a, a burden to the neighborhood. Is that already outlawed by your understanding? By the yes. So what I hear Bruce saying, and I agree with him, that the ordinance as written already prohibits no outdoor storage of equipment or materials that would include the truck. Therefore, it's not necessary for us to include either one of those as a condition. So we're, left, we're back to only two possible conditions, and that is signage and walk up, drive up sales. There is no sign. There never has been a sign. So signage doesn't appear to be an issue for us to make that a condition which leaves us with only one, sounds like, issue as to a condition, and that is do we impose a condition that there be no walk-up, uh, drive-up sales out of the home? And as Dr. Chapman said, the application is presented to us as a mail-order business, and it probably should be considered as on that basis. <coughs> And it's an area that has the greatest possibility for abuse in terms of increase of traffic flow. Right. <clears throat> okay. So it sounds like there is a consensus, am I right, that we have two conditions to impose. One, that there be no um, exterior signage. 
and second, that there be no walk up or drive up sales. Yes? Okay, then let's go to the standards for conditional use approval under the ordinance. Um, first is, uh, the first element is that any conditions prescribed for such conditional use will be satisfied and they will be that there be no signage and that there be no walk up or drive up sales. Um, second, uh, let's go through the other elements and vote them um, up or down. Um, could we have a show of hands of all those who find that the proposed use will not create hazardous traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in the vicinity? And that is found in the affirmative. Six in favor, zero opposed. Uh, next, a show of hands of those who find that the proposed use will not create unsanitary conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air, or other aspects of its design or operation. It's found in the affirmative, six in favor, zero opposed. Uh, next, those who find that the proposed use will not adversely affect the value of adjacent properties. And that's found six in favor, zero opposed. Next, a show of hands of those who find that the proposed site plan and layout are compatible with adjacent property uses and with the comprehensive plan. It's NA. It's NA. Or, it's not applicable, is it? Not applicable. And finally, uh, those who find that the design and exterior external appearance of any proposed building will constitute an attractive and compatible addition to its neighborhood, although it need not have a similar design appearance or architecture, and that also appears to be not applicable. So could I have a motion from someone um, that the application of Brenda Simpson Eight Susan Road, Road, tax map U43, lot 36, for a conditional use permit to operate a home business, specifically Allen Flag Company, as a mail order business, uh, be approved with the stated conditions that there be no exterior signage advertising the business and that there be no walk up or drive up uh, sales of um, business um, inventory or equipment. So moved. Motion, Mr. Mendelson, a second. Second, second. Second, Mr. Keneally. Discussion on the motion. All those in favor? The application is approved, six in favor, zero opposed. And that takes us back one item on the agenda. Just put this away. Someplace I know I have an agenda. Thank you. <laughs> that is to hear the administrative appeal of Charles M. Sexton of the Code Enforcement Officer's April 11, 2003 denial of building permit number 030521 for a single family dwelling on property of 51 Woodland Road, tax map U01, lot 60. Mr. Sexton. Thank you. I'm Charles Sexton. Thank you for your time as volunteers for doing this. Uh, I did write you a cover letter which explained uh, my argument 
here on this appeal. And I'll just try to summarize it real briefly for you. In 1983, um, I bought a piece of land from the town of Cape Elizabeth. It was about 79,000 square feet and included the old cottage farm school. Uh, we had to get two approvals to uh, change the cottage farm school into uh, dwelling units. Um, the ordinance provided at that time that we could have one dwelling unit per 5,000 square feet of land area. Um, so we could have had, or we could have applied for, 15 units to put into the cottage farm school. When we, after we bought it, we looked at it with our architect, and we decided, after many iterations, that the probably the best plan for us was to do eight units in the old school building, uh, which would be large units. Uh, and to thereby only use up about 40,000 square feet of our land area and then have enough land left over for a single family lot, which would be a separate investment for us. So we went to the zoning and planning boards with, with that proposal. And uh, that proposal was approved. Uh, and we built the eight units. Um, and um, we don't have good files. Um, I've, I've searched my files, this was back in 1984 when those approvals were made, um, uh, and I have some, some things, but my files have been moved all over the house and I'm missing stuff, and I helped uh, Bruce search for files here too, and we found some, but we didn't find complete files. Uh, so we only have sketchy evidence um, as the approval. We do have the zoning board's approval, and they stated in a, in a statement of fact that um, the land area is in excess of 40,000 square feet, the amount required under the zoning ordinance. Um, and I stated in my cover letters to the planning board that we had 40,000 square feet plus in one place, and then in another place I said we had in excess of 40,000 square feet, which is the amount required. And we don't have an official statement from the planning board regarding the square footage. At least we couldn't find one. Um, so uh, right after the approvals in 1984, we went ahead and, and rehabbed the old school building. Actually, there's a little bit left out because the old school building burned down and we had to come back and get reapproval and build a new building and the old foundation. But it's essentially the same application, same eight units. Um, in 1984, we then had the, the land survey. And you have copies of the, the surveys, I think, with the 1984 date, to at least to show our, in, our understanding from the approvals that we only needed 40,000 square feet plus, or in excess of 40,000 square feet for the condominiums, or for the apartments. They're not condominiums, they're apartments. We thought we would convert them, but we never did. Uh, and um, so in 1984, it, you, you see that we did subdivide at that point in our own files. We never subdivided before the city. We never came in and did whatever you need to do to subdivide uh, a lot because um, we figured we could do it later. Now, I guess we didn't want to be taxed. On, we didn't want to do anything to upset the assessor and increase our assessed value at the time. Uh, but we thought, we thought for 19 years that we had a single family lot. And we've been thinking about selling, so I came into Bruce uh, just to confirm so I could tell people, yeah, here we've got a single family lot. And also because we wanted to change the boundaries a little bit of the single family lot to make sure that we could have uh, the uh, landscaping go on the right lot. And um, Bruce, um, saw the, the plus after 40,000 square feet and the excess and denied our, our, he suggested we apply for a building permit in order to assure ourselves that we could uh, have a lot. We don't want to build anything there at this point, but I applied for a building permit for a foundation uh, just to, and, and we'll build the foundation if we have to, to establish the fact that we have a lot um, there. So, um, all I can say is that the, the we, we didn't use exact numbers at the time in 1984 because we didn't have exact numbers. 
we, we didn't do the survey until after the approval, but our intent all along, and I believe we expressed this to the board, to the both boards, there's only board and the planning board, our intent was to have 40,000 square feet with some extra, depending on where the landscaping was, uh, for the building, and then a, a single family lot in addition to that. But I can't prove what I said to them. There's just no, no way to do that at this point. And I can't remember my exact words at all. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, first, Mr. Sexton, despite the fact that you say you don't have great records dating back that far, I'd like to commend you on the thoroughness of the application that you put together for us. I think it's pretty remarkable that 20 years later you were able to reconstruct what you were able to do for us. Um, I think you did a great job putting together the materials to frame the issue for us and give us the historical background and documentation to be able to understand what happened back in 1983 or 4. So my, that's my initial observation. It doesn't mean you're off the hook. Oh, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> but I do commend you for that. Thank you. But I'll open it to questions from the board. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, walk through the reasons for the denial at some point. Uh, why don't you do that now, Bruce? OK. Uh, the one ingredient that's the important ingredient of this whole scenario is, is the fact that neither Mr. Sexton nor the town has the original site plan. Uh, if we had the original site plan, that would probably answer the questions. But for some reason, that's non-existent, even though uh, in his application to the planning board, um, he, that was one of the requirements. Uh, there's, there's, no, there's no site plan to be found. So I had to piece together what, what I could through the records the Board of Appeals and Planning Board, building permit application and the like. And uh, I passed out this sheet tonight to you. I'd just like to go through where the highlighted sections are on, and the reason for my, my findings. Um, on the first page, Zoning Board of Appeal, when it asked for a legal description, it, it included tax map <coughs> U01, lot 60. So it didn't save a portion thereof. Uh, that's number one. Um, if you go to the next section, it isn't highlighted, but it's application for plan examination and building permit. That's on the uh, fourth page. You'll notice that, that, that the application for the, uh, the uh, eight units uh, says 69,700 square feet, which is somewhat under the 79 that he had to the survey, but as Mr. Sexton just spoke himself that he didn't know the size of the lot. So for the, the eight unit was, was supported by a 69,700 square foot lot. Uh, if you go back to the next section that's highlighted, uh, which would be as part of the board, Zoning Board of Appeals, um, he was asked uh, if he had any future plans for further development. Uh, his response was that he might consider additional units in the basement in the future, but at this time the plan is for that space to be used for storage. Uh, there was nothing said about any kind of a lot that was going to be separated from this uh, land area, um, but, but he did reference that he might use some of that land area uh, on the density issue to put additional apartments in the future. The findings of fact by the Board of Appeals uh, on the next highlighted section is that, that the lot is in excess of 40,000 square feet. Tells me that that it was more than just the original parcel. Um, that it was the entire parcel. Um, same thing on the planning board. Um, size of parcel 40,000 square feet in excess of. Um, I did share you, I don't think, no, that this map is really pertinent other than that was the original configuration of the two lots um, prior to them merging to become the schoolhouse lot. Uh, they, were, they made up two triangles. Um, I don't know how pertinent that is except that um, it's interesting without some, at least some of the land from the next door neighbor, you know, the, the lot that wasn't the original schoolhouse lot, that the building 
line is, is virtually at the corner, or the property line is virtually at the corner. So I don't even know when they were they were, they were merged, but that really probably isn't that pertinent. But I just wanted to show you the original layout. Um, and I'll answer any other questions you have as need be. Could I respond to that? Yeah, absolutely, you, you may. Sure. Um, the, I believe Bruce, uh, Mr. Smith mentioned that uh, I identified the property as, as uh, map U01, lot 60. That's, that's true. Uh, and that's the entire parcel. And that was identified, I guess, in a couple of places. Um, but in the but that's really just an identification of the location in the in the, in the tax uh, on the tax map. That's not a. Uh, I don't think that should be interpreted to mean that the whole lot was being used for uh, for the for the eight units. Um, because right after that, in the, the copy I have of the application to the planning board, where I identify map U1 lot 60, which is in fact the full 79,000 <coughs> square feet. The next blank to fill in is size of parcel, and the words that are filled in there are 40,000 square feet plus. And that's intended to mean at the time, and I think the boards took it as that, is, is that we've got the 40,000 square feet, at least 40,000 square feet that we need for the eight units. Um, the 69,000 number is shown somewhere else on another application where the property is asked to be identified as map U1 lot 60, and I can only interpret that to be simply a place where you were supposed to put in what you thought the size of map U1 lot 60 was, the identification of the parcel of land that you had, not the parcel of land that you are allocating to the eight units for which you're applying. And um, I don't know how to respond to the, where, where I was asked, I guess, I didn't realize there was some testimony that you had found, that I was asked about plans for the future at the uh, Yeah, we, the we talked about that. Oh, okay. Um, and I guess I said, didn't have any for any further units except maybe some further units in the basement. Well, this is what was in the, Remember when you came back in? I told you I I, I yeah. had the packet by yeah. which I made I based my denial on, and, okay. and you you looked at that. So. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I know you did. You gave me that. Yeah. I'm not saying to give anything. I guess I don't. I guess I don't find the fact that I didn't mention the lot, the separate lot, in response to that particular question as dispositive of anything really. Well, I, I, I think it, I find it hard to to understand that, that the plan board, even back in '84, or the board of appeals back in '84, wouldn't wouldn't make some comment um, through the approval that 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 if indeed there was a, a, a separate parcel or a part of this lot that was going to be used for another use, that that wouldn't be part of the conversation. Um, granted, we have no site plan, uh, which makes it tough, but. Um, I, I, I still think that, that that most planning boards are thorough enough, so they say, you know, you know, they 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 want to know the long-term plan of the whole lot, and, and if there was going to be something split off that that showed on the site plan, that I think either one of the both boards would probably question what that use was going to be at the time of approval for the site plan for the eight units. Well, I agree. It, with seem, you. it seems it seems strange to me that they wouldn't even talk about it through any of the minutes um, for lack of a site plan, plan and the evidence. That's why I, I'm, I'm, I'm led to believe that the entire fossil was included in the original site plan. I guess I would agree with you that I would find, I, I, I think we did discuss it. You mean, I didn't realize that we have the entire, we, we have minutes of both meetings or? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's in this back. Well, that surprises me. Uh, I, all I can say is that I, I think it was discussed that we applied for 
for our eight units with the 5,000 feet a unit. That was the whole basis of the application. Yeah, the site plan review for the planning boards here and the Board of Appeals minutes are here. Well, the way I read this entire packet, I understand what you're saying, Bruce. The way I read this entire packet is that there are multiple references to establish and to verify that at least 40,000 square feet was being used to satisfy the requirement of 5,000 square feet per unit as the maximum density. Um, I don't know that it matters what <clears throat> Mr. Sexton's intent was at the time. I'm trying to discern what the town's intent was at the time in granting the permissions that were that were given back in, was it 1984? And it seems to me that based on the ordinance that existed at that time, the town was merely concerned that in fact Mr. Sexton was devoting at least 40,000 feet to these eight units. Um, and it doesn't quite seem logical to me that there should be a requirement that he devote the entire 79,000 feet Am I using the right number, 79,000? That's the correct number now. The entire 79,000 feet when he was entitled to do what he did using just any amount more than 40,000 square feet. He now has 30 some thousand feet available in an RC district where only 20,000 feet is required. Am I for multi, reading that right? multi-unit, you have to have five acres. Right, but for a single family home, right now. Right now is 20,000 square 20, feet. 20,000 feet, and he right has. now it's five acres for multifamily, also. Right, right. But at the time, he only needed less than an acre. Right. 40,000 feet to build uh, his eight unit apartments. I mean, short of something compelling in the record that would have required that he devote the entire 79,000 feet, it seems <clears throat> reasonable to permit him to carve off 40,000 plus feet, which he would have been permitted to do at the time this was originally approved, and use the remaining 30 some thousand feet for a single family residence. I understand that today, five acres would be required for the eight units, or the multiple. What, what's the five acre requirement for any multi-family? Multi-family, you have to have five acres to start. Of course, he doesn't have five acres no matter how you cut it. So. I, did, I did consult the attorney before I made the decision to deny, and the attorney agreed with my findings. I probably should have got it in writing. I thought it was fairly obvious from review of the records that this that for lack of a site plan, you had to, to look at the intent. And, and without a master plan for, for a separate lot on the same one <coughs> unit, uh, one parcel, I don't see how, how you can now make the argument that, that, that you can also carve a lot off because it was carved off originally. Um, but do you, do you know when that rule change from 40,000 square feet to five acres? Do you, can you guess as to it? I don't know. Sometime probably, I don't know. But today this lot of 79,000, give or take, is considered a non-conforming lot, is that correct? That's correct, because of the use. But, but from a usage standpoint, it's it's a non-conforming lot because a lot to support a multifamily dwelling needs five acres. Um, and this is where this may become pertinent if indeed you, the board rules that, that uh, there is a separate lot 
it, the, the lot that, 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 has, that he has established has to meet the definition of a lot by today's standards, meaning right. it has to follow, it has to follow, um, I don't have my book with me, but it, if, if, if you can't create a lot without following up a lot line that, without meeting the definition of a lot. And the definition of a lot is, is, is something with ascertainable boundaries, either described in a recorded subdivision or in a, in a recorded deed. So you can't just arbitrarily create a lot of 20,000 square feet. You, you have to follow the lines that was originally given for that lot if we get that far. It just can't be an arbitrary 20,000 square foot law because it never was it never was created. It would have to follow lines to meet the definition of a lot today. I'm not sure I followed the uh, read the definition of the lot in your zoning ordinance. All right. Please. A parcel of land with ascertainable boundaries described in a recorded deed or shown on an approved subdivision plan and meeting zoning requirements at the time it was created. But that's, that's I guess that's another discussion if we get that far, but I'd have to look at that, <clears throat> how the lot could be configured to meet that definition if we get to that step. I didn't really give that a lot of consideration because I didn't think we, I didn't think we'd get that far. So, so there, there is no, so I'm clear, there is no subdivision here. There, there never was a subdivision. There was, part of the slot was made up of an original old subdivision. Um, I don't know what the name of it was. Right. But you'll see all these subdivision lots. That was part of what you said. This part was, yeah. Um, so if these were in a recorded subdivision or in a recorded deed, mentioned in a recorded deed as, as parcels, then, and you determine that there was a separate lot, then they have to follow some of those old lines. Can't, you, can't just, you can't just make a new lot. It has, to be, it has to be defined as a lot by definition today. It has to meet one of those. Well, if, if Mr. Sexton surveys off 32,000 feet from this property and transfers it to, are you married, Mr. Sexton? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm listening to you. Are, are you married? Yes, sir. And he transfers that to his wife by a recorded deed. Haven't we created a lot? Today or then? Today. If won't we, a, if, won't if we not, then? Won't if we this then? was a lot today that, that supported a multifamily unit of, that required five acres, the ordinance would not allow you to set to, to carve off 20,000 square feet. Period. So the only way that could be a non-conforming allowable lot is if the lot was meets the definition by today's standards. Okay, a lot so it was in existence. Okay, I understand. You're focusing on the multifamily lot that remains. No, I'm not. I don't want to focus on all acres. this at all. I don't really want to focus on this yet. I want. We need to make a determination on whether I made the right call, and then, and then th I'm just telling you that that could it, be an it, issue. It, Bruce is me. Non, I mean, under that theory, he's not. He's not conforming no matter what he does. There's only 80,000 square feet. It's two acres, less than two acres. If this board decides, determines that there's there is that all he needed for that original site plan was 40,000 square feet and as was excess land left over, then we have to determine where that line was drawn by today's standards based on the fact that, the, that, that, that it, had, it has to be a lot that was in existence that meets the definition today. Bruce, when an application for a building permit comes before you, I mean, we don't have a lot that's defined as a single residence Let's, can we focus on, let's focus on whether I made the right call, and we can get into that if you'd like. I don't, I, I'm wrestling with a whole bunch of things I think we all are right here. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainties about 
many details of this. I mean, I, I'm still wrestling with, I see 67,000 square feet one place and mm -hmm. 79,000 another place. I don't know how those reconcile. Yeah. Yeah. But this is a separate issue. I probably shouldn't even brought this up at this point. Well, we we're, grasping, we're grasping with a complex issue here that has many facets and we're trying well, to... Well, I, I would suggest that, that if, 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 we, if it's too complicated that we may, maybe go on a hall attorney and to, to have, ask him to come to the meeting and explain why the call was made. Um, but I think this is a separate issue. Well, to me, I, I mean, to me, when I look at it, the issue is, is there a law? I mean, I, Mr. S Mr. Sexton is our attorney, is that right, Esquire? I'm a um, re retired attorney. Okay, retired I haven't attorney. practiced law since. And, and your letter says, 86. we have kept these surveys in our files, thank you for the last 19 years that we had two lots. Well, I'm not an attorney, but I would never think I had two lots unless they were registered. Oh, no, I don't offer that as the fact that there are lots. I just offer that as evidence of the intent of, and I agree wholeheartedly, it's my intent is, is, is not, not an issue here. It's the intent of the zoning and planning boards. And I offer that simply as evidence of my understanding of what was approved at the time, which is evidence of what they approved. You can accept that. That's not definitive evidence, but it's just, just evidence. That's all I offer that for. See, I, I see an approval uh, the building inspector, before I guess I went to the planning board, on an application that identifies a lot as 67,000 square feet. And I, again, I mean, that's another element of ambiguity, why 67,000 square feet, and why it's not 79,000 square feet. But I mean, I see the application that you put before the building inspector at that time, identifying the lot as having 67,000 square feet. So it's to my mind, again, I'm very simple-minded on this, to my mind, if you actually own 79,000 square feet, then I only see 12,000 square feet <coughs> as possibly usable for other purposes than what was applied for then. Yeah, let's, let's don't uh, get confused between 69 and 79, because at the time, before the survey, I didn't know how much, nobody knew how many square feet were in the total parcel. So I think we thought it was, the total parcel was 69,000 at the time. It turns out to be 79,000 when it's resurveyed here in 2003. So, that difference is, is, is really not an issue here. The reason I'm saying that that 69,000 was put in there, that was intended to be the entire lot, the entire, the entire lot that we bought from the, the city of the town of Cape Elizabeth at the time. And that was intended in that section, I'm saying, simply as identification of the parcel that was right there of U01160. But in the sections where we deal with what we were applying for approval for, we always said 40,000 square feet plus, or we had an excess of 30,000 square feet. And I'm simply arguing that that really meant um, that we had at least the amount required in the zoning ordinance. And when the approvals came forward on that basis with 40,000 square feet plus, that's what the zoning and planning boards meant is that we met those minimum requirements and that's all we had to have and you draw the line, as long as you drew it and you had at least 40,000 square feet, you got your approvals. That's my argument. <clears throat> I, I don't know, I'm, <laughs> I've been on this board for a few years, but I still, this is a land use question I haven't dealt with before. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the reason it wasn't subdivided earlier, any particular reason, like uh, why you wouldn't have had that the well, in retrospect, I sure should have transferred it to Rosemary a long time ago, put it in the registry. But well, you wouldn't even necessarily have to transfer it. If you would, if the files clearly stated that there was an excess of 20,000 that you were going to use for single family, then that, that we wouldn't be here tonight. You know, well, when you went through the plan board and the board of appeals, I would think you would have submitted the site plan and talked about your, your, your plan to, to keep a separate lot of 20,000 square feet. I guess I thought that was clear. Done. Well, there's nothing in here to indicate that. That's what I guess that's why I had to make the decision I made. I, Mr. Trent, I'm still trying to do some detective work here. If you can be patient with me, I, I'm trying to answer your initial question, Bruce. And this m map that you passed out tonight, the date of this is prior to 1984. Yes. Okay. In the <clears throat> application where the 69,000 feet is dated, it has to be a typo, it says 
December 7, 1963. I think that has to be 83, with the 69,000 feet as, as mentioned. But to my very simple way of thinking, this, these are the two maps that were included in his application. No. 1984. No, those were done several months after the application to the Board of Appeals and Planning Board, after he got approval. So we don't have the map that they had? There is no site plan. Those were created after the approval. They have nothing to do with the approval. Because well, in fact, we don't know. We don't have the map. That would, that but the date on there is after the approval. Because uh, the 1984 map clearly shows a lot, and it's identified uh, the same. The same lines are identified going back, going back, back, and back. But they've even been configured since then. But they, they, they were those. those what's so the, these were these were not the maps that were in the. No. What's the date on it? This is 1984, September 7th, 84. Okay, and approvals were um, before that. Well, wait a minute. Uh, there, you've got two maps there. Mm -hmm. Twelve seven eighty three. Is, is this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. That's this is this is set. prior to eighty four. And does that have a date? That that's, that's not dated. Okay. No. That's prior to these. Okay. These were made after the approval. Mm -hmm. And I simply show you those that are explained in the map. Mm -hmm. Now, this map. I don't know what the date is. Yeah. And I don't know whether it was in the original package to the planning or zoning board or not. No, I only say that this is based on the original subdivision that was part of Cliff Avenue and that this line was the original um, division between the two parcels. Yes. <laughs> that represents well, the that represents what was on the face of the earth prior, prior to the whole lot becoming merged. The, tri the two triangles makes up the lot that, that exists today. Mm -hmm. And that's all that represents. But those site plans had nothing to do with the approval. There is no site plan for the approval. And the 1984 surveys that were prepared well, the specific dates, the surveys that were done in September of 1984 are evidence, in my mind, that this idea of Mr. Sexton's is not something that was dreamt up in the last few months. It's something that he obviously had in mind dating back to the time of this original proposal, or at least within a few months thereafter which dates back 19, 20 years. We, we do not, in our packet, have a copy of his application for the single family dwelling on U1, U01 lot 60, do we? We have two copies of, well, we have a denial and administrative repeal, appeal form but we don't have a copy of his application. The building permit application that, that, he, that I denied? Yeah. That's in the package, sure. I see that. If you look under the stuff that, that Mr. Sexton submitted, I didn't, I didn't copy the building permit application again because he had it, he's got it in his packet. Uh, the denial. I, I, the obvious point that stands out to me is that you have a, no, I, I do not have a copy of that. No, Thank you. No, nor do I. Nor do I. What? What's its significance? I don't know. It, uh, I don't have a copy of this. Okay. But, uh, describing the structure and this plan. I, 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 my question is how you you currently own a lot. U0160 that has an eight unit apartment building on it. Yes, sir. You applied for a single family 
dwelling building permit for you zero one sixty in your mind how are you for how are you going to rectify that you you already have one property one dwelling one structure on a lot add a second structure to the same lot and subsequently i guess split it off what I, I, i'm confused as to that it seems to me that the lot for you to apply for a permit would need to have a different designation 60a for example or, or whatever numbers available or would be issued by the town for a separate lot well i think we're talking chicken and egg here i don't, I don't think the town's going to give me a separate tax assessment number and, and on, on, the, on the tax map uh, unless unless i've got a legal lot well i see i would i would see that you would create the lot first and then apply for a permit i don't see how you can apply for a permit to build a structure on a lot that is, is not a divisible entity. How do I create the lot? I mean, I go into the tax assessment. I have a, a survey of the lot. Do I take that into the Well, tax? that brings up the other obvious issue. If there is no lot created. And as the ordinance reads today, since lot 60 is a non-conforming lot by definition due to size, it's not a five acre a uh, uh, lot to support a uh, multi-family uh, apartment. Uh, it's considered a non-conforming lot because it's less than five acres today. Since there's not a separate lot in existence today, I think we're faced with the issue of uh, taking a non-conforming lot. Can we, do we have the ability to make a non-conforming lot more non-conforming? And as of today, we do not is my understanding of the ordinance. We cannot take a non-conforming lot and make it more non-conforming. Now, if it was a six-acre lot, I think it would be very easy to carve off an acre. But we have an 80,000-square-foot lot for today's ordinance states that it must be five acres. So it's already non-conforming, which is fine as it sits. But I don't think we, as a board, have the ability to, to carve that lot, subdivide an existing lot. That's my point. Well, uh, the reason, Mr. Smith. Well, the reason why, uh, you know, I, I think it, it doesn't really make any difference how we got here. I mean, the issue is 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 can a building permit issue uh, based on Mr. Sexton's argument that that there always was a twenty thousand square foot lot there because it was excess of what he needed for the forty thousand. But so a lot of it, it was the lot established back in 1983 when he got approved. It certainly wasn't with a tax map and law, which probably should have been done because that would have we wouldn't be here talking about this if indeed that was the intent. That never was done. Uh, uh, Mr. Sexton here is to prove that, it, that 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 was excess land that wasn't part of the original site plan, and therefore there is a lot there. I, 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 but if there's no property line. I, I have to agree with Dr. Thomas. I, I, I think that, unfortunately, um, whether we concur with, with uh, your opinion or, or, or not, um, at, the, at the time, there wasn't an appropriate subdivision. There wasn't a delineation of two separate lots. So as I understand, and I think it's Jay's understanding, of what you are asking this board to do, and that is to correct history. And I would think that's probably beyond the purview of this board well, to do that. And, and over the duration, it would seem that apparently your intents were, were extremely valid at the time. But to, to acknowledge that intent, I would guess that you would need to have a lot number assigned to that separate excess of 40,000 square foot uh, a town assessment based lot number to designate it and and the, the lot line to be recorded. I think those two things are, are minimum requirement at, in my mind is to sanctify the, the separation of that lot and at that time apparently it it was legal and proper for you to be able to do that, I guess, uh, due to the ordinance at that time. That, that's the Can point. Can for just a second? Yeah, Please. It seems like you don't, uh, uh, all 
almost what you're saying is if somebody has a piece of land and they don't subdivide it immediately, they can't hold on to it unsubdivided and subdivide it later. Um, Not if the ordinance changes. The ordinance has well, changed. Yeah, you, you, have, you have allowed, you, you are relying on the, on, on the status of the laws that existed 20 years ago. That, that law has changed. Well, even more than that, you, you can, you can subdivide, if you have a piece of land, you can subdivide it today. And I, I believe before you get a building permit approved, you have to identify an approved lot that it's going to be done on. We don't have the authority to approve a division of this lot. I believe it's a planning board application that you have to put in to get an no. approved division. Now, whether they'll approve it because no, no, it's making the planning board has nothing to do with this. The what? The planning board would have nothing to do with this. Sub, uh, well, subdivision. Who, who would approve a division of the lot? Well, my office for, for into two. If you go in three or more, then that's a planning board approval. But I'd make the initial call whether the ordinance allowed that, no matter what the issue. So um, maybe he should have applied to me to divide the lot, and, and I have you. I, I say no, and they, he takes that to the Board of Appeals, but the method by which we did it was to apply for a building permit on what he assumed was a separate lot. So it got you there, the same issue was still before you. I mean, but that is the issue. Is there a lot? I, I think his intentions are clear, as David said, from these November, uh, September 1984 drawings, but they weren't registered. Um, and so the question is, the real question is, do we have the authority to approve a division of this lot? I'm not sure we have that authority. Um, and if we did have that authority, would we approve increasing the non-conformity of the non-conformity lot by making it smaller? When Dr. Chapman was talking before and started to talk about making a non-conforming lot even more non-conforming, at the time he was talking, I was reading this section of the ordinance um, Article 4, which deals with nonconformance, and specifically, uh, well, on page 33, there's a paragraph that deals with developed nonconforming lots, and it's paragraph number 2, and subparagraph A deals with single lots. And I was actually looking for something in the ordinance that said exactly what Dr. Chapman referred to, and that was the inability to make an existing non-conforming lot more non-conforming. Is there something in the ordinance mm -hmm. that says that? It seems that there should be, but I'm, maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. Yeah, there is, but I, don't, I didn't bring my book with me, so. <laughs> if you had a book in hand, would you be able to find it? I believe so. <laughs> but if you go back to the term, my reason for my denial, I, I said that there were, the, the, the reason why that it was denied is because no further subdivision may be allowed. So I, I, I got there. Um, I think it's... Let me go back to page 31, which is the page I had with David. Talking about and paragraph C in the 19-1 reduction in lot size, except as expressly provided in this article for a taking by eminent domain or conveyance of right. no lot shall be reduced in size by conveyance of a portion thereof unless the remaining land meets the minimum lot size required for the zoning district. Yep. That's it. Land is located. That's it. Now I, I believe that that condition number one would say that. We can only do this if you had more than five acres, since it's today's standards that would apply to the breaking off a piece of land or reducing the lot size that the um, apartments are on. You know, we simplify this and simply, I mean, I thought I was asking you to interpret the original approvals of the Zoning and Planning Board. And it was a simple question of whether they wanted uh, approved this with, with at least 40,000 square feet or whether they approved it with, with the entire lot. 
And if they approved it with just a requirement that there be 40,000 square feet, then at the time, I certainly had a right to um, draw that line, uh, which I did. Um, and I guess I just didn't go, if you're telling me, far enough and somehow uh, split the ownership there. Instead of keeping it in my name entirely, I should have transferred it to my wife at the time. And then I would have had a lot, I guess. Um, that seems, I don't know, that doesn't seem right. I'm not sure it's transferring anywhere else as much as it is registered with two different lots. I think that or was bring it down here to the tax office and say, I want you to right, or the off and registry of raise my taxes. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, I but I, I think your I think you're framing sort of the the perceived unfairness correctly. That if you had done that under the old law, you could have done it, and you could have sat on this unbuildable thirty thousand square foot lot for these twenty years, and you wouldn't have had a problem when it came time to apply for a building permit. Well. To Mr. Sexton's defense, if indeed, to get back to the original approval, if indeed the, the, the boards decided that, that, that 40,000 square feet plus was, was what they approved the site plan for, and there was another lot that, that, meets, the def, that, that meets the definition of a lot, either recorded subdivision or described in a deed, then whether that was a separate lot number or not, it makes no difference today. See, my, my interpretation was there was an application that said 69,000 square feet, and all they said was that it exceeded the 40,000 square foot requirement. Well, and, and the, 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 the fact of the matter is, because it's plus 40,000, I think the focus was that eight units, 5,000, he's got enough land. Right. I mean, if you make the determination that it, was, it, would, it only needed 40,000, and, and, and all the approvals were based on something more than 40,000, what is that approval? 42, 48, 50? I mean, the fact of the matter is, everything was approved with a plus on it, which indicates to me that it was, that it, they put that down there to, to, to make sure that the records were clear that there was enough land to support eight units and nothing more. So that's why I think the site plan is entirely included the whole lot, because there was no mention of anything in excess to be used for any other use. So I think you still have to make that call. And if you, and if you make the call that, that the site plan included the whole lot, then end of story. If you make the call that, that there is excess land, then it comes into play of is it, the definition, because he never made it a separate lot number, does the lot that he wants to, to, to develop now meet the definition of the lot by today's standards? So that's why it's twofold, and that's why this issue is only an issue if you determine that, that the entire parcel, that, that only 40,000 square feet was dedicated to the, for, for the site plan for the eight units. Otherwise, it's not an issue. Well, I read this, as I said at the outset, to say that I think the intent of the zoning planning boards at the time was that 40,000, no more than the, the amount of land required, be devoted to the project. And that, if that means 40,000 and one foot, so what's a plus that they would have approved it at that. So what's a plus mean? It just meant that they were satisfied that he met the minimum criteria of 40,000 feet. I think that was Mr. Sexton's interpretation, too, and that's why he got these drawings, these, uh... I, I still, it still bothers me that, that none of, if that the intent was from day one, <clears throat> why isn't there something in the record to indicate that? You, I mean, if you go back to any site plan, if there's, you know, the first thing planning boards look at it, even back in 84, was what the overall use of the parcel was going to be long term. And there never was a discussion of, of, of surplus land to be used anything other than dedicated to this eight unit apartment building. And when asked by the Board of Appeals what his intent was for long term, he simply said that he may use some more of that land to develop more uh, apartments in the basement. 
he didn't in no time did he come forward and say i've got you know i got twenty thousand square feet that i'm going to build a second single family dwelling i mean i, I well, don't understand what, where where where, can you, where does it say that, that there was only 40,000 square feet dedicated. But what I hear you saying, Bruce, is that it really doesn't matter because the end result has to be the same regardless of what the intent of the planning and zoning boards were at the time. No, am I hearing you correctly on that? If you determine that, this, that there's only 40,000 was approved, that there was excess land, and then I have to look at the next step. How was it? It, it does does whatever excess land there meet the definition of a lot by today's standards and that and I have to look at whether it was in a recorded subdivision the division or in a recorded deed and do we know the answer to both of those questions no because that that only comes about if indeed you decide that there's excess land let me offer an interpretation and uh, mr. Sexton may want to comment on it um, Mr. Sexton went before the planning board and he responded to that question. And that's all he had in his mind at that time. And a month later, two months later, three months later, he said, well, all they really needed me to provide was 40,000 plus square feet. I can re really break off another piece of that land for another building lot. And he d actually did this six months later, or seven months later, whatever it was. He didn't register it, but it was done. Nor did, nor did he contact anybody at the time to, to get an approval for that. Nor did he ask no, I realize, the to have a map and I realize that, and that's, that's why it's it murky. Well, but, but he didn't do anything that he believed was in contradiction to what the planning board wanted from him at that time. That's, that's one interpretation of the, you know, what it might have happened. If we had a site plan, we, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But yeah. no, I understand. That's why. Um, that's why it's murky that these were drawn but not registered. You know, we have a density issue today. Uh, Bruce, I, I, I still come back to to my dilemma, and that is, does this board have the authority to essentially um, create a subdivision? I think the board has an has a, has a, has a authority and the obligation to determine whether there was excess land, at the, at the, whether there was a legal lot that was in existence from the day of the site plan approval because not all the land wasn't dedicated to the, to the eight units. I think you have a, 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 an obligation to make that decision. Um, that's what's before you. Um, I think I'm understanding uh, what you're saying now uh, when I really didn't before. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but this, this is the deed from the town of Cape Elizabeth to myself. And it is deeded to, to me in two parcels. Um, parcel one, and these parcels are shown on this map. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether everybody has this map or not. Yes, we do. Does everybody have this map? We do have that map. We do. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Parcel 1 is where the two and a half frame building is shown, that triangular parcel. And then the second parcel consists of eight certain lots or parcels of land situated in out of the park extension, so called, being number 52 to 59. So actually, actually, we were deeded nine parcels. This one triangular parcel and these eight mm -hmm. lots that you see, numbered 52 through 59. Um, and I think what Mr. Smith is saying is that if you find, and we had this discussion, if you find that the, if you interpret the intent of the planning and zoning boards at the time to only re have required 40,000 square feet and have excess land up in addition to that available, then I think what you're saying is that land has to be in legal, has to have been at the time, I guess, in legal lots. So it's got to, it's got to follow these lot lines that were there somehow. That's correct. And to continue a little bit further, the last discussion we had, remember, I'm looking, and I've always thought I only wanted one lot, but what we discussed
discussed the last time is that if you decide that um, there is excess land that they only wanted 40,000 square feet originally, then I've got all these lots in here. Uh, I don't know, one lot, I got, I got maybe eight lots here. If that's what I want to draw the line. Um, but I've got to make those lots um, at least 10,000 square feet if it's on a sewer. I assume the sewer is there. I'm not sure of that. It's in the building, so it's going to be there, available. So if I've got 30,000 square feet, I could, I don't know, I haven't done this. Maybe I could figure out how to put these lots together to get three lots out of it. Now, I mean, I don't know if we need to address that now. I mean, I don't want to do that. I never did want to do that. It wasn't my original intent. I only want one lot, what I originally thought. And if it takes, if I have to follow some original lot lines to get one lot and put them all together, I'll do that. It seems to me kind of, you know, kind of arbitrary and unnecessary because I wanted to put the, the lot line on the other side of this row of trees, which separates the uh, building which we planted at the time, separates the multifamily building from the separate lot. Mr. Sexton, where roughly is the line that you're trying to draw? If we look at this drawing, is it somewhere around the, the lines on like lot 56? In the middle of lot 56. The straight line from across the lot in the middle of lot 56. This line you see farther east mm -hmm. with a, if you see a 25,000 foot parcel on one side of the line and a 53 foot parcel on the other mm -hmm. 53,000 forget that 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 was I, I'm not sure where that came from I think that may have been a line when the surveyors originally put put the line on that we wanted to separate a lot but it's I don't know where it came from is this a recorded document? This is the one you're pointing at. I can't see what you're pointing at. Is this the? This, is this document re right? Same. This document, is this recorded? Yeah. I don't believe it's recorded. The, the, this part of it is. This upper part is Ottawa subdivision. Ottawa Park is recorded. But I don't believe the lower part is recorded. The, the meets and bounds description of the two deeds from the town. You're saying that they don't tie to to this map? The deed is in two parcels. One parcel, the meets and bounds description of this triangular piece. Okay, and the other is... And the second parcel is eight lots that's shown on lot 56. Okay. Those are the two parcels that the surveyor wanted to separate. Okay. And the other parcel is the one that was shown on the plat on part, So the deed supports that survey map. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this, this is a, a, a survey representation of what oh, the deed is. So, and, and who, who, who had this prepared? Uh, I think I must have at some point, because James Robbins is a surveyor that I hired to do the survey after the approval. And I can tell you that, but I can tell you that the planning board would not allow an eight unit apartment to go in with a configuration of this triangle, which means that some or all of this, the remaining lands had to go with this to make this work. This is not a site plan that they would allow using the triangle with the, with the line setting on the corner. I mean, it, that goes back to the same point that some of that in excess of 40,000, or maybe even in excess of 53, because this lot's 53,000, had to be included with the original site plan. Did, did the, at the time the town owned this whole building, did they own this whole? They owned the whole parcel, yes. 
And, so and the, it's my understanding they changed the ordinance to be able to sell the building to something for something viable, and they made an, they made specifically put in the ordinance that 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 former municipal buildings could be used on on a lot for apartment buildings as long as the density of 5,000 square foot units per unit was was allowed. And then after this went through, they took that back out of the ordinance. It's not in the ordinance today. So okay, the they made an exception to, so they could sell the school building. Um, and then they went back to the, then they took it out. I don't know what year that was, but. But it is possible that, that, I'm not suggesting they did, but they saw this, this, this man, with this line, and thought that I was going to have 53,000 in 20, 20, <coughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know that, because this is not in, this is not in my file of that, I can't prove that, one way or the other. If, 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 this a lot. Those two come out to roughly 79,000, which is what your 53 plus and 25 plus. Yes. That would be your 79. Apparently, you didn't have access to this document at time of application, or you would not That's have put 69,700. Unless I just did that hastily and said 69,000 instead of 79,000. You put, uh, which, well. Yeah, I don't, if you're right, I mean, it doesn't add up. You put 69,700 in multiple spots of your app, or on your application. And I don't know where that came from. Maybe that's what was shown on the uh, tax map. I wonder if that's where I got that. Okay. That may have been where I got that number, because I was identifying the tax parcel when I, when I, where I put that. You identifying the entire law? Yeah, I identified the entire tax price as we were through, through all the applications. So what it comes down to 20 years later is um, we have conversation of 69,000 and 78,000 in a language and some minutes talking about 44,000 plus. And I just, I can't believe that without a site plan that we I mean, to me, the difference is too great an amount of land to think that it was not a lot of land. I'm sorry, say that last statement again. To me, I mean, the amount, the amount of land in this, we had the land that was deeded to this gentleman and two large parcels that ends up to 79,000. We have uh, his application, we can get 69,000. And then we have the minutes, because we don't have the actual site plan. Um, telling us that the project for the building, for the multi-unit building, is going to be 44 plus. 40, 40 plus. 40 plus. Um, what happened to the rest of the land? I mean, I, 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 there's no explanation of that. And I, I can't believe that that land, I guess my way, of, I think the way you do, sir, I just don't, I don't know how they could have approved you know, it would be nice if we had the site plan, that would answer everything. But we don't have the site plan. But even in the minutes, if, if you had a developmental project and it had 70 plus thousand feet into it, and all the minutes only talk about 44,000 feet, where is the explanation? You know, how do you explain the difference in the parcel? Um, I mean, I, I think it's very logical to assume that you had another a lot there. Even though it's not recorded. I mean, Say that again. What did you I think it's logical to assume that he had, in his thinking, he had another lot. Um, you know, it would, it's like doing an archaeological dig. We're trying to go backwards uh, with minimal records. But the records we do have, the numbers are just the numbers that are being created around it are too large. And to have a, a project approved uh, at 44 plus. 40. 40, sorry, sorry, 40 plus. And the documents that supported that, we have some of the stuff that's before that is way over that. Then what was he doing with the rest of the land? He was deeded all that land. I mean, to me, the project that was approved was the 40,000 for the building, but I think he had 
Well, that's a plus me. You tell me. Well, I think the, to me, the, the, I interpret the plus as meaning you have the bare minimum for the 5,000 per unit. I don't think the plus meant 30,000 feet. Now, I think the plus, I think it's fairly obvious that the, the reason that the application and the reason the minutes refer to 40,000 plus is that everybody was simply wanting to make the point that they were satisfied that this lot met the minimum criteria right. for 40,000 feet. That's exactly my thinking. And that's all they cared about. That's they knew that, that Mr. Sexton had for, more than 40,000 feet, and that was okay with them. That's they didn't right. care whether it was 60,000, 80,000, as long as it was more than 40,000 feet, they were going to exactly approve it. Exactly my point. That they wanted to make the records clear that he had enough land to support eight units. I agree. That's what the 40 plus means. Right. I, we're in agreement. However, for a hypothetical, if, if, the, uh, if the ordinance were to change next year drastically, uh, say it changed in the year 1999 and Mr. Sexton came before us now and he had a lot that was becoming more nonconforming, I mean, there are some, usually some grandfather features looking at uh, the, the, the time interval of when the ordinance changed and when someone's trying to make an application either for a variance or for um, or especially not performing lots. I mean, in 1984, which was a year after his original approval, these maps clearly sh that he had made clearly showed two lots. I mean, I think his intention at the time, and that's purely my personal feelings, um, is that he always had a lot there. Now, now we're sort of stuck in this area of we have a lot that's not recorded. Well, assuming that we were in agreement that what the town cared about at the time was that at least 40,000 feet were devoted to this eight unit apartment building. Then the question is, well fine, what 40,000 square feet do we carve off for it? Right? I still think it, from my understanding with planning boards and working with planning boards and board of appeals throughout the years, that they, they want to know the master plan. And, and, and if a site plan had been submitted that showed 20,000 square feet cut out or some portion thereof, that the record would indicate so, that it would not blindly approve it based on the fact that the total application was for map U01 lot 60. What was the, do you know, Bruce, what the uh, minimum lots requirement was <clears throat> for a single family dwelling on? What it was at the time? Yes. Probably the same it as it is today. 000. So it was 20. Yes, it was yeah. 20,000. I mean, Mr. Sexton, do you have a copy of these minutes we keep referring to? Uh, you know, zoning yeah, board. I think you gave me, but I don't know. I don't know what happened to them. Yeah. I have an extra copy of yeah. you. you have yes, I do. Uh, yeah, the Board of Zoning Appeal Minutes dated January 24, 1984. And that's, that was the statement that... It wasn't for 40,000 plus. It just, I, I just can't understand where we're, how we're getting there, that's all. Your, your statement earlier, I think, is, is very valid. In that if he only needed 40 to construct the building, then so be it. The thing that, the item that concerns me is that in these minutes dated January 24th, 1984, apparently they had that same question. And on page two, it says, Mr. Sexton was asked if he had any future plans for further development. And his response was simply that he might use the basement space for additional units. And I would have guessed at that time that if he did have future plans for further development, that at the time of the meeting, he would have indicated that. And that, that's, I think that's the issue, one of the issues that Mr. Smith has brought up. Well, the figures don't work because it, it says additional units. Okay, if you take if you take the original 40, say assume that they supplied 40 to the site plan for the eight units, 
and you add 20,000 for the lot he intended to, to set aside, that's 60,000 square feet, right? Um, well, no, that will work. That would work with more than one unit. Well, I don't obviously don't remember this particular encounter uh, and these, these minutes. Um, I guess all I would say as an alternate interpretation is that these are not that the secretaries don't record things accurately, but it, it, this is a little bit removed from what was actually said in the context and what was actually meant. And I can see this as I can see myself thinking of the eight units when that question was asked and thinking, no, I just want the eight units. And thinking, I guess maybe, I guess maybe I said something about future units in the basement. I can't imagine that. It isn't very amenable to future units at all, the basement. It's the old basement of the Cottage Farm School. It's the old foundation. It's kind of damp. And, you know, it's got some chicken wire um, storage units in it. And I guess I must have said something about that. Maybe that was before we actually built the units. And the, the other point is that the lot line that you have shown on this survey of 9784 doesn't seem to coincide with any of the light lines on this undated. No, it doesn't. It wasn't intended. And I would have guessed that uh, trying to follow along with Mr. Smith's interpretation of if there was an existing lot line, we can, in, in this plan, that we can assume that it stands whether it was designated or not. And I, I understand his point there. If it had fallen and coincided directly with one of the existing lock lines on this earlier uh, subdivision, and apparently it doesn't, it goes right, as you stated earlier, it falls somewhere in the middle of lots 56. So it, not only does it not follow a, a, an ex partial existing lot line, it, it goes in the middle of an existing lot on this earlier subdivision plan. Uh, where Mr. Mr. Chair? Um, uh, yes, I'm sorry. I was just reading further on into the minutes. It's 10 minutes to 10. We have one more case. Do you want to make a decision whether you're going to hear that or not? Because if you're not, then we should, so he doesn't have to wait. Um, it's going to it's going to put us quite late. Um, <clears throat> my guess is we're not going to wrap this up in the next 10 minutes. Um, it's a policy of the board to not hear cases after 10. To not hear a new to, case after 10 o'clock. Um, yeah, we probably should tell Mr. Uh, Duddy that we'll hear his matter next month. Where he went. Well, but we'll see. Um, but I'm looking at now at the at the minutes again that have the paragraph in it that you had highlighted about Mr. Sexton's response to future plans, if, if he had any future plans. And I'm looking now at the, the very last paragraph on that page. I just wonder if if this sheds any light on it. It says, Mr. Callis moved that the conditional use request as requested in the plan be granted with the proviso that the dumpster be shielded from view as far as site off property. The motion was seconded by Mr. Wolchin. The motion was amended to include the provision that the wooded area between the parking lot and the abutters remain as presented in the diagram. The vote was unanimous to grant the appeal. I guess the question both to you, Bruce, and to Mr. Sexton would be, um, what would be the wooded area between the parking lot and the abutters be referring to? It would be to the left or the rear, right? It wouldn't be yeah. on the right-hand side. Yeah, the parking lot is on the west and the north. Okay, so so that doesn't help us uh, the, with this issue. This was an open, actually, this no. was the old playground over here, so this wasn't wooded. Okay. So that doesn't really address the point. Well, although, excuse me, your, your uh, 
your application for conditional use does refer to wooded areas on all sides of the structure. Paragraph D says the proposed site and plan and layout are compatible with adjacent property uses with the general plan. Proposed site plan and layout are compatible with the adjacent property uses consisting of single family residential to the north and east and apartments to the south. The proposed site is well buffered with wooded areas on all sides. Oh, well, there, there, is, there, is wood, there are woods on all sides now. The property is surrounded by, there are two tapered streets outside the property which are all wooded on, on, on the north and the east. And then over here is the Pistachi property where the uh, pond is, which is uh, unbuildable and it's, it's all wooded now. So, I mean, it is in a wooded, wooded area. What would have happened had you developed, if you were to develop the adjacent lot? I'm sorry. What would, what would happen to the to the wooded to the buffering on the one side if you were if we were to find that there is an adjacent lot here, a separate adjacent lot? Well, we have a driveway. Kind of come, we the way we envision this is the driveway would come off Woodland up to the lot where somebody put a house. And these, these this land is owned by the town as a paper street on surrounding the lot. No, I'm sorry, that's around really from the north and the east. Am I answering your question? I'm not sure. I'm, maybe I didn't. Well, I, 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 you know, again, we're, we're, we're trying. Well, I, and we're, I, and, we're and, trying, and, to, we're, we're trying to, to uh, sort of restore history here. And I think so, that's a, a valid question that both the Board of Appeals and Planet Board would ask if they knew that there was going to be a lot on that side. Um, I don't know why they wouldn't ask that question. And your, your application to me, Mr. Sexton, implies that you, um, that you're, you, you intended to maintain the existing environment to the extent that it was wooded in the surrounding that, ex that structure, the, the school building, whatever was there. And, um, and you specifically state that your intent, that, 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 that the site, uh, because of the existing woods, is, is, is buffered. And it just seems to me that if there was, if, there, if you were going to develop the, 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 the property adjacent, this, this additional 39,000 feet, uh, perhaps you would not have couched um, your response to, to uh, paragraph D in, in the same manner. Well, I guess that's your, that's your interpretation. That's what I'm asking you to do, to interpret the intent and make a decision. Well, I, I would say this, that the, when, when we went back, I didn't, I didn't think this was necessary, and I didn't have a copier to do this, so I didn't send it to you. But when, we, when, the, when the school building has redeveloped, as it developed in the day, was burned down, when we came back in for our <coughs> approval of the new design, the, the planning board approved, of eight units again, new construction, with the condition that I come back in with the landscaping plan. And I came back in with the landscaping plan. This is the land, you didn't copy this, did you? No, because that's all it is, the landscaping plan. It's not the site plan. That's right. Uh, so, I mean, it's just going to show the landscaping around the building. So, so in response to your concern, I guess all I would say is that I came back in with this landscaping plan, and this is the landscaping plan approved by the, by the uh, Planning, which really only deals, I didn't have a lot of land here, but it really only deals with the 40,000 square feet. Here are the plants, and, and it only deals with the building. It doesn't deal with this section over here. Or obviously, these woods here are not my woods. I mean, they're, they're adjacent owner's woods. And over here, it's a little bit. So I don't know whether that. Adds anything to the analysis yep. or not? Um, I, I ran out to show you 
the building as a whole, then that could be argued that that's what they were concerned about. They weren't concerned anymore about any other property. I had just a couple of other questions. Thank you. Yes, it was. No, that's fine. Thank you. Well, that landscaping plan postdates this, so I assume it's like two years after this, right? Well, yeah, here's what happened. In early 1994, the planning and zoning boards approved the project. We then went ahead and had that survey done that you just held up. We built the project, and it was days from opening. It was virtually completed. We had five units leased, and in October of 1984, it burned down. It was spontaneous combustion of oily rags in the box in the corner of the basement, and it was destroyed. And then we came back in the following year for reapproval of a new design because it had to be a new building. And that was when the landscaping plan was made a condition of approval. When you came in in 1985? That would have been 86 when we came back after the fire. And you had to apply for a building permit again, another building permit to rebuild? Sure, you would have to, yeah. I guess we did. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, does that permit application show the lot as 44,129 square feet? Oh, my God. That's an important piece of documentation. Yes. Is it? I don't know. If the original bill put showed 69 and you're not taking the – if that doesn't mean much, why would another permit showing 69 be important? Because we have these. I think these are highly credible that he, at least for his own purposes, subdivided this after the initial approvals. And whether it shows up any place other than this is a question in my mind. I can look at the file. I don't believe there's a building permit that I could – I couldn't find a building permit that was later, but I can look. Excuse me, Mr. Duddy. We have a local rule that says that no new matters will be taken up after 10 o'clock in the evening. Unfortunately, we have labored over two matters far longer than we thought we would. I would have anticipated that we would have gotten to your matter an hour ago. That obviously didn't happen for reasons that are not your fault. But because of the rule that says that we won't take up any new matters after 10 o'clock, we'll have to table your application until next month. I hope that doesn't present an undue hardship to you. But that's where we stand. So you're free to go home this evening rather than sit here and wait until we finish up this matter. And the board will take up your application next month, assuming that you're in town and available. Otherwise, it will be rescheduled at your convenience. So I apologize for the fact that you've spent the evening with us without anything productive to go home with. Very good. Thank you. Sorry. I do have a copy of it. This is not going to help. I have a copy of the bill from 1986. I'm not sure if it's in the packet because it says C plan. Yeah, see, what I'd like to see is a copy of this kind of application after it burned down, the rebuilding of it, because this requires a lot size. But it won't get to file. I'm not sure they did that. Yeah, this doesn't appear to identify the property itself other than 51 Woodland Road. Thank you. 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 Thank
No, I agree. That doesn't answer any questions. Now, it does say, um, well, it says where it's, there's a sentence that, where it's asking the applicant to put in the dimensions of the building. It says C plan. Yeah. So apparently there was a plan of some kind. Now, I don't know what that plan would show the lot area. I don't know whether that was the, I mean, we did have drawing, uh, architectural plans. Right. And uh, I, I have those at home. They're all, you know, in a big roll, but it doesn't show the, I would have, I'll bring them in. You can see them all. Oh, Bruce. It doesn't show the land, though. No, but if you had to put together a building permit application again, uh, rebuilding the burned down building. Yeah. I assume it would be the same format, and so it would be very helpful to us if in this lot size you've now identified it as 44,000 square feet as shown in the subdivision that you did yeah. with these uh, surveys. Well, I'm not quite sure what Bruce went to find, to find the, 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 the building permit? Yeah, the building permit application. Application. The application permit we just looked at. Okay. I look, I know this doesn't make any difference. I, uh, I, I was looking for any kind of evidence I could find. I, I think this is already, this is, this is subsequent proof of my intent. This is a letter dated July 17, 1986 to Betsy Greenstein. Um, from me uh, about the loan we were getting to build, and uh, it says, um, following our telephone conversation of 71586, I have closed for your final copies of two plans prepared by Judge Robinson. It's in your conference represented by these plans and contiguous to be got to comprise of the school property. Right, I understand. I will give you a more on both properties to secure the $350,000 loan, which is the subject of our commitment. You are preparing an addendum to that commitment whereby you can release a smaller $34,000 but unimproved property related to plan property deal with me after completion of the construction of the Ashburn State, a larger $44,000 square foot of property, on which to transfer both of the small properties. But I'm going to have to the loan. That's just further, further evidence of what I thought. And, and the 34,000 square foot property that you're referring to is what? That would be the lot. Balance of this one. Okay. Uh, let me. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, that's what Which is why in the landscaping plans you had a, a line of pine trees that were put just east of the building. Yes. Yeah. And there was nothing between that and the natural border on the far east part of the original parcel, correct? That, that's right. That was the uh, playground yeah. from that over to the um, paper street, right. which of course has never been built upon in his woods. So there, are, there already was a wooden buffer there. That's right. So you had another line of trees. My assumption would be for that parcel of lot to develop, for that parcel of land to be buffered as well. Correct. On the, on the east and north, there was a, there was a buffer of trees from the uh, Saber Street. Well, rightly or wrongly, it seems clear to me, Mr. Sexton, from the surveys that you had done and from this letter to your mortgage lender, that it was clear that you intended and thought <coughs> at least sometime shortly after the original application was granted that you had a separate buildable lot. I don't think there's anybody up here who questions whether that was in fact your intent. I don't think, it's clear that, that you didn't concoct this last year and think maybe I'll find a way to get a buildable lot out of this. Right. You've clearly had this in your mind for 18, 19 years. Right, I thought we had a long-term investment here. So nobody's questioning that aspect okay. of it at all. Okay. 
the question seems to be what did the zoning and planning boards intend and is there a way that we can impute your intent to those boards that's right one one point i had down here to to make sort of in closing was that uh, I believe there's a, there's a time-honored uh, tradition or um, more than a tradition rule of law that when a, a zoning ordinance impinges upon a landowner and there is ambiguity or doubt, the benefit of that ambiguity or doubt should be given to the landowner. And I would ask you to deliberate with that in mind. In terms of interpreting what the boards men at the time did they only men how, how did you arrive at the uh, at, at your dividing line the, the uh, in 86 uh, used uh, the meets and bounds is uh, north 39 degrees 20 minutes 50 seconds west H how did you How did you arrive? And you, you did your two separate surveys. Yeah. Um, you only needed 40,000 right. plus, plus a foot. Right. Uh, we told the surveyor to put the line on the other side of the trees that he planted. The surveyor will allow him to be in the Okay, so, so, so there were, so you, you planted a we line across. Okay. And he made up the, the building coming to Do you know that this plan that was referred to in here, uh, plan of property uh, dated 9784, it, it shows two pins on the property line that under discussion labeled to be set. Do you know if those pins were ever set? Yes, they were because that's what they found in 2003. Can you? Can you document that those were set? I would think that you would be able to do that. Uh, let's see if on the uh, certainly the surveyor would, uh, registered land surveyor would keep documents. We do not have that. And to further add to the grayness of all of this, it, the, this note from the bank, you're requesting them to release the smaller unimproved property. Apparently they agreed. Wouldn't the bank demand a and, and and I keep going back to it seems like for anything to be legal and verified it would be recorded. Uh, do you think that the, there was any documentation recorded? Because I can't see the bank I, I don't know. I would not guess that a bank would make a loan on an unverified property or unrecorded property or, or a market survey on the property. I would think that there has to be some recorded documentation to it. I mean, you seem to present the evidence, everything but that it was 
recorded document. The, the town assessor does not demonstrate it as a smaller undeveloped lot as the bank refers to it. So we, we can't fall on the town to support it. It's not recorded in the court, uh, Cumberland County Courthouse document uh, records. Uh, did the uh, and, and, did the lender in fact release the thirty four thousand square foot parcel? In other words, would there be a a, 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 a recorded release with a legal description for that 34,000 square foot parcel. I don't think so. And I, I, my memory is that we just uh, pay off a loan and never, and never did it. It never, never became important to do. It became important to us to have that and, separate We still own it. We haven't. And I agree fully with what Mr. Backer said earlier. We can only assume that your intentions and your uh, items that you presented to us are, are correct and valid and, 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 and sincere. Uh, we just need some documentation is my feeling. We need, and real estate is typically not sanctioned unless it's recorded. But help me, other people on the board, but that was my interpretation that lot lines and divisions are not sanctioned. Well, the, the, bank, the, the, the bank would have taken uh, based on this letter, that the bank would have would have taken the mortgage, or a mortgage against the entire piece of property, and, and not really been concerned about the smaller parcel until he asked for the lease. Unless it was a separately documented recorded entity, is that correct? I mean, they would have released. They would not have released it unless it. Well, the, oh sure, they they, they could do a partial. They could do a partial release. They could do a partial release of yeah. the whole piece. I mean, for example, I have one recorded lot that my house is on, and I recently asked my um, mortgage lender to release its um, lien against a small portion of it, and they did. And that's, and that's done all the time. But that doesn't necessarily define it as a separate lot, does it? No. Okay, I guess that was my point. But that's not a separate structure. I mean, you couldn't go out and that one piece that they released, I guess you couldn't subdivide now. And say oh, no, it was a very small sliver that I was <laughs> trading with my neighbor. No, I couldn't do anything with it. Mr. Sexton, I, I don't believe that there is anyone <clears throat> on this board I shouldn't speak for, for the others, but I, 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 I think I, I speak for, for Dr. Chavis. And I, I, it's obvious that Mr. Backer feels this way. Uh, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take a chance and say that we all believe what your intent was uh, and has been for uh, 18 years or so. But. Uh, is there is there anything that you can point to that you can give us that helps us then if 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 Bruce is correct that we have the the authority on this board to to uh, interpret what the zoning board was thinking in when you when you made your application for conditional use is there anything you can you can point to that will help us in trying to figure out what they were thinking. Because all we've got, at least as I see this, all we've got is their thinking, you've got 40,000 square feet, you're good to go. And if you had had 10 acres, based on what you, what you presented here, you've got your 40,000 square feet, so so you have you have sufficient square footage to comply with requirements for the for the uh, conditional use. Other than that, I don't I don't see anything in, in the record that, that helps us. I, I don't. I, I've given you everything. I mean, I've scoured my house and uh, given you everything that I could 
find that I thought was more on the, on the question to approve a very test uh, the zoning and planning plans. I think that's a, actually a good maybe analogy that you just made. What if I had had 10 acres um, and they came and they approved the eight unit in the same way that they did where they said he has an excess of 40,000 square feet or he has 40,000 square feet plus would you reasonably interpret that to mean the whole 10 acres? Or did I just add half the 40,000 square feet? I mean, where do you but, draw well, the it, it cuts both ways. Where do you draw? I, I don't know. Draw the line. I mean, well, uh, maybe, maybe in the minds of someone who was sitting in, in, in my chair said, well, um, you know, he's, he's got double what he needs, adequate, looks good, like the idea, like what he's going to do. He's going to restore this, 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 this school building, the historical structure in this town. Um, I, I like the plans. Maybe that's, maybe that's what they were thinking. Uh, that's my problem. It's a very sticky wicket here. To answer your question, if you had 10 acres, then it wouldn't be an issue. You have a conforming lot, it would meet the ordinance today. What we're trying to, to determine is the basis to grandfather your existing non-conforming situation. And that's, that's the very definition of grandfathered situation. Something that used to be okay, and it didn't okay today, but since it was already prior recorded, documented, under the prior ordinance, then it's okay today if you're grandfathered a separate lot. And that's the very definition of a grandfathered situation. If you had five or ten acres, it wouldn't be an issue. You would meet the ordinance today. But that's where we're hung up on is the very issue that was mentioned earlier is that you're in a non-conforming situation and we can't make that, the ordinance states we can't make that more non-conforming. Where, if it had been grandfathered, we Bruce, see, could you find wouldn't me? be an issue. Uh, the building plan application says total land area square feet. It says on file. Well, when I look at um, I the history here, oh. I I see Mr. Sexton's actions as being entirely consistent with the notion that the zoning and planning boards didn't require any more than 40,000 square feet for this, or that they required that there be at least 40,000 square feet and that that's all they cared about. I don't see anything in his actions or any of the documentation that's inconsistent with the notion that all that was required was 40,000 square feet and that they weren't and that the zoning and planning boards at the time were not requiring or mandating that this entire parcel be devoted to the eight unit apartment building. I, I know we don't have the one recorded piece, but the more Mr. Sexton shows us, the more I'm satisfied that the intent of the zoning and planning boards at the time were to merely require that 40,000 feet be dedicated to this building. There's, there's nothing at all that we've seen that's inconsistent with that. And everything we've seen that in Mr. Sexton's actions taken from several months to a couple of years afterwards are entirely consistent with that. And I can't, and, and surely he didn't have in his mind at that time you know, back in 1984 and 1985 and 1986, the notion that he was going to somehow take advantage of a potential change in the ordinance at a later date. I just, uh, I can't believe that that was going through his head. I still believe that the plus was there for no more than to indicate because of a new change to the regulations to indicate that yes, indeed, it, 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 it followed suit with the regulations, meaning that the records were clear that there was plus 40,000 square feet. 
I believe that they wanted to dedicate 40,000 square feet, that, the, that the, 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 the record would say that this site plan is based on the fact that there's a lot of 40,000 square feet or 42,000 square feet or whatever it may be, not an arbitrary figure of 40,000 plus. Uh, that plus means that, that, it, that, that it can be any, it's not 40,000. It's something more than 40,000. And, and I don't understand how the board can sit here and decide that all they needed was 40 when the records rate from day one indicated that, that, that the lot was plus 40. Um, you know, I, I truly believe that Mr. Section probably believed that he, he uh, maybe had a building lot there, but uh, I still think that it, it, sh it, it, it was, if it was intended from day one, that it, it would probably ended in the conversation either through the wooded area situation, what buffered, how, long, how close is that line going to be to the, that you're going to create? To well, apparently property? neither board ever said and never made it clear to Mr. Sexton that he was obligated to use the entire lot. Either that or the comment fell on deaf ears, which I think was I think probably the site unlikely. Plan showed a separate lot, though. I believe the records would indicate that, 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 that all the parcel 60 was not going to be dedicated to this. And there's no indication whatsoever to that, to that effect in the files. None whatsoever. Yeah, we don't have a copy of the site plan. No. That's correct. That's, that's a big deficiency. Um, so if, if the board determines that, 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 that there is excess land, I think the board has to justify what the plus means and, and what, how much of that land is dedicated uh, to. Okay. Well, why don't we, I think we've gone at this as long as we can possibly go. Um, would somebody like to make a motion one way or the other as to the intent of the zoning and planning boards at the time this matter was originally heard back in 1984? determination of what the intent was. This, this, unless there was a copy of the site plan that was approved at the time, which I guess there is not, we agree there's not, there is no other way for us to know exactly what the situation was with the zoning board or planning board at that time. Um, so there is ambiguity. Um, and as Mr. Serkson said, uh, in the case of ambiguity, uh, the zoning board has to or more or less support the landowner, I think, in terms of uh, interpretation. Mr. Jackson, let me um, ask you one more question, if I might. And, and you may have answered this earlier, and if you did, I, I apologize. Um, again, looking at, at your application for a building permit um, that you submitted, Uh, on December 7th of 83 so so that would have that would have been the building permit for the for the conversion of the schoolhouse is that, is that not correct okay yeah um, in response to the, to the lot size you your reply was that the lot was 69,700 square feet which is approximately the total uh, a few percent margin of error of, of, of this uh, survey that, that you showed us with the triangular lot and then the nine smaller lots, the, the deed from the town. Yes, eight smaller lots. 
Pardon? It was a 10,000 square foot area. 25,000. 70. 70. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't I'm know at the time. 69. But you did say 69,700 69, square feet. Yes, I've seen that. What, what what do you think was in your mind at that time? Why didn't you say uh, the lot size was 40,000, 40, 41,000, 40,500? Uh, I guess all I can say is that I was inconsistent. And I think, <coughs> thinking at the, I think where that is, is right next to where I identify the tax uh, map and law. And I, I think all I was intending to do at that point was to say that's the size of the lot. That it wasn't si that's my total size of the tax map lot for identification purposes. That's the that's the tax map lot where this building is going to be built. Well, I, I might say that the permit was issued based on the facts of that building permit. I'm sorry, Bruce? The permit, the building permit was issued on, on the facts of that building permit as submitted by the applicant. That it was a 67,000 square foot lot. 69, whatever it is. same thing applies back then as it does today that the code officer or somebody would have been working with the landowner if, if indeed there was a separate law to make that part of the record at some point if indeed that was the intent of, of, of from day one with both boards it just doesn't go away this you know I mean if, if somebody did that today and got a site plan approval for a portion of a law the code officer would, or the planning board or the, or the board of appeals would advise them to, to some extent to make sure that you, you may do, get some provisions in place so that that doesn't get lost as it, as it has in this particular case if that's what happened. I can't believe everybody would just walk away from it if, in, if indeed the records indicated so, that, that there was a separate law. There's nothing in the records at all, anywhere, through any of the files, including the building permit applications, to indicate there was a separate law ever divided out of that, including a separate tax map and law. There's nothing in the files to, to substantiate that. Well, I thought you told us to take this one step at a time, and the first step was just to try to determine what the intent was which is I think, where we've been focusing for the last hour. Right. And, and you do that based on the facts of what you find in the, in the ordinance, I mean in the files. I'm not quite sure if I follow what your, your meaning is. So you're saying that based on his application at the time that he is dedicating 69,700 feet. Well, that's just one to, of many, that's just one of many Factors that I believe right. that, that indicates that, that there point was never was another law was that that was his in, apparent intent, intent was to contribute 69.7 or the full assumed full amount of the property toward the the apartment. I believe so. Okay. I guess the only thing I try to add to that is that we is. Um, uh, the things uh, I don't think uh, I, I think we things have evolved uh, since then. Everything is more thorough. The Internal Revenue Code is a lot more difficult and detailed than everything else today than it was in 1984, and, and so are the procedures of of uh, zoning and planning boards. I think, and uh, I, I just don't think you should expect the. Uh, we're missing a file, and we, we, we should have. But I, I think things were done looser then. Well, can we, uh, I, I, again, I think we've probably delved as deeply as we can possibly go into this. Um, I'm willing to entertain a motion from someone 
um, going either way on this, if anybody's willing to make one. We have an obligation to act on the application, one way or the other. What's on the table actually is an, an appeal for decision of the building permit. And I think what you're asking is, you know, sort of the first finding of fact and what that was, what was the intent. I'm not quite sure that that's a, a motion or whether that's a sort of a finding of fact that we can sort of construe. I mean, to me, the, the, the phrase that uh, sums up this to me, there's nothing in the files. And I think that cuts both ways. There is nothing in the file, and um, including nothing in our files and, and no site uh, map from the planning board. And what we have is, uh, I think, a credible array of information from Mr. Sexton. If you're quoting me that there's nothing in the file, I said there's nothing in the file to indicate that it was a separate lot ever recognized through any of the, the, the decisions through planning board, planning board, Board of Appeals, or the code office. Right, but there's also nothing in our files in terms of planning board files to say, you know, we could sort of pull out and say, aha, here's the, here's the site map. Um, we keep on coming full circle that we want to act, but we're, uh, I think, being torn on to, uh, you know, we're being asked to figure out what the intent was of a board 20 years ago without, with a minuscule amount of the data that they reviewed. So we're, we're basically being asked to look at their, <clears throat> their decision without the benefit of the fact of the application that they had or any of their, you know, we have one set of minutes. Well, the way I see this, um, in terms of a motion, that we should either have um, a motion to um, uphold the denial of the building permit for the reason that the town records indicate that the original approval of the eight-unit apartment building um, was for the use of the entire parcel or that there be a motion that the denial of the, bill, of, of the permit be reversed um, based on a finding that the town records um, indicate that the intent of the zoning board and the planning board back in 1984 were that um, the entire parcel was not necessary to be used, but just that at least 40,000 square feet be used. That's the way I'd see the motions, one way or the other. And then either way, you have to back it up with findings to that extent. Well, so what does that mean? Either, either way you vote, you, you're going to have to back it up with findings based on, so to, to, you know, based on what you found. And there are arguments to be made either way. I mean, I've stated where, how I read it, but I also recognize that it can be read the other way also. Um, Somebody did it make. It seems to me that the that the um, that the absence of any clear indication or clear requirement that the full 69 or 79,000 square feet be used, combined with Mr. Sexton's actions in the months and years following the original approval are consistent with an intent that the entire 79,000 square foot lot not be required to be devoted. 
somebody did make the statement, and I need to clarify that, that well, I guess it was Mr. Sexton that made the argument that when, when in doubt, you go towards the tax, the, the citizen, and that has got to do directly with the ordinance. That hasn't necessarily got anything to do with the decision made based on, on, on an act of the code officer. That, I think you have to weigh that on, the, on whatever facts and treat each one equally and not give weight to, to the other side simply because, I mean, in the ordinance it does. If the ordinance is, is ambiguous, then, it, then the law does state that you, you, you go towards the side of the, of the applicant. But that isn't necessarily true with, with decisions from a town official. Yeah, we're not interpreting an ordinance at this point. Right. We're interpreting a 20-year-old, a 19-year-old decision of the zoning and planning boards. This wasn't an arbitrary decision. I, I gave this much thought. I also did, you know, I well, Bruce, discuss you it. Well, you don't need to defend your well, decision. Well, no, I do. Because I mean, I, you've done that I, uh, well tonight, and you've been a good advocate for, for your position. Um, so I, I don't think you feel, should feel a need to defend yourself. We understand exactly why. And you made a tough call here. And you've put a lot of thought and work into it, as you always do in your decisions. We've, um, I don't think this board has ever questioned, and we certainly don't tonight, I thank the, you for that. Uh, the thought that you put into these, and they're always well-reasoned, and this one is too. Which makes it all the harder. If we thought that you were clearly off base, this decision would have been made an hour ago. <laughs> Maybe I should have been. <laughs> so, again, I don't think either you or Mr. Sexton need to sort of defend your respective positions because you're, you're both acting clearly in good faith and um, with what you truly believe is the right course. Well, gentlemen, this is where you really earn your pay. Do I hear a motion? Do you want to, would you restate how you believe this motion should be made? Which way? I mean, I'll, I'll try and restate a motion to restate it either way. Restate it. Uh, well, you, you, you clearly uh, appear to side on, on Mr. Saxton's uh, side of the, the, the uh, bench here. Well, I, I do personally, but I'm willing to, to frame the motion either way, whichever no, way. Well, why don't you frame, the, frame it in the affirmative and we'll just, we can vote up or down. Okay. Um, then can I have a motion? Reversing the denial of the code enforcement officer of permit number 030521 based on a finding that the records of the Zoning Board of Appeals and Planning Board with their decisions dated January 24, 1984, and February 14, 1984, respectively, combined with the actions of the applicant, Charles M. Sexton, in the months and years following 
the decisions of the zoning board and planning board support a finding that neither board required that the entire square footage of lot number U, uh, of tax map U1 lot 60 be devoted to the eight unit apartment complex at 51 Woodland Road, but rather that no more than 40,000 square feet be devoted to the apartment building. That's probably the best I can do <laughs> off the cuff. <laughs> Could you summarize that in 12 words or less with your opening statement regarding the, the code officer, Mr. Smith's decision, so that we all clearly understand what you're saying? Um, to summarize it, it would be that the code enforcement officer's decision uh, be reversed and that he be directed to issue the building permit. Is that less than 12 words? That the code that we're voting on, <clears throat> whether we're going to reverse the code enforcement officer's decision. We're voting on whether we're going to sort of reverse his denial of the permit. And that's what's been appealed. Mr. Sexton had a building permit application denied, and he has appealed that denial to us. And it's up to us to either affirm the denial or reverse it. Well, if we vote in the affirmative, we're supporting the applicant. Um, a, vote, a vote in the affirmative on the motion will be a vote to a vote in favor of Mr. Sexton and a vote overruling our code enforcement officer. Thank you. Explain. So is anybody willing to put forth you, you did it such so, a motion? You did it so eloquently. Uh, can can uh, Secretary read back? <laughs> what, Mr. Back? <laughs> Next week. <laughs> Don't ask me to restate it. <laughs> well, hearing nobody stepping forward to make the motion, oh, do. I will make the motion as, as worded by Mr. Backer. A second. A motion by Mr. Keneally and a second by Mr. Mendelson. Discussion on the motion. Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion as presented signify by raising their hand. Three in favor. Opposed? Three in favor. Three opposed. The motion fails. <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> That's it. If the, um, if it's it, uh, so it not carry, then it's denied. And um, Mr. Sexton, unfortunately, that is a ruling on your application, um, and it is denied. I understand. Thank you very much for grappling with it. I well, appreciate your time and effort that you devoted to this. 
wish it had come out differently. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for the effort you put into it and your patience with us. Yeah. Mr. Sexton, I, I would just like to say to you, uh, for the record, repeat what I said before. I in no way have any problem with what you believe your position was. Yes, it is. Yeah. I, I, uh, I uh, hope you uh, take this for a well, that concludes our new business, um, with the exception of the appeal of Mike and Jennifer Duddy, which we've tabled until next month. Um, next item on the agenda is communications. There are two. Uh, we were given a copy of a decision of the uh, case of uh, Glenn and Marguerite Prentice versus the town of Cape Elizabeth um, as decided by the Superior Court. That is simply there for your information with a uh, copy of the cover letter from the town attorney, uh, Michael Hill. Um, the other item of communication is one that um, is no surprise to anybody and that is that this is my last uh, board meeting um, as a member of the uh, zoning board. I have enjoyed my tenure on the board. Um, as of next month I will be sworn in as a member of the town council which will uh, require that I resign from the board um, and I will. But I thought it appropriate to uh, resign as chair of the board tonight to give the board an opportunity to elect um, a successor chair to fill out the remainder of this year until the regular election of a chair um, in, at the first meeting of the calendar year next year. So uh, with that, um, I would like to tender my resignation as chair and turn the uh, proceedings over to uh, Mr. Keneally as the secretary to okay. run the meeting from this point forward and to carry us through perhaps the election of a new chair and an adjournment. Let me, uh, first of all, I think I speak for everyone on the board. Thank you for uh, extraordinarily good service, uh, providing us the benefit of wise counsel of a, of a good attorney and some very thoughtful decision making and leadership on your part. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Second. You know, we'll miss you. Well, I'll miss you. If there was a way to stay, I'd stay. <laughs> oh, uh, would anyone like to make a motion to uh, elect on the chair? I would. Um, prior to doing that, uh, for the record, I would also uh, like to, to add my appreciation to David uh, for his leadership, his wise counsel, and uh, above all, the, the uh, manner in which he conducted uh, these proceedings. Um, my uh, my experience as an, as an applicant and uh, years ago as, as an attorney representing clients before proceedings such as this um, have, have always led me to believe that, that uh, no matter which way you decide, uh, you're, 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 you're probably going to upset someone, uh, whether it's the party in interest, whether it's someone on the, uh, who's, who's representing the town. In this case, it could be Bruce. Uh, but in more instances than, than not, uh, the nature of these kinds of proceedings, it can be um, uh, neighbors. And it's a very difficult process, I think. And, and David, uh, I've been very impressed with the way you conducted these meetings. And, and, uh, I, I 
have, have enjoyed my limited tenure on this board, and, and hopefully our, your successor will, uh, will carry on in that vein. Which brings me to the uh, uh, motion for um, a, a new chairman. And I'd like to put before uh, this board the name of uh, Dr. Jay Chatmus. I'll second the nomination. Any other nominations for chair? Would the board signify by raising their hand? Vote in favor of the nomination of Dr. Chatmus. Any opposed? It's unanimous. Six to zero. Dr. Chatmus, you are now the chair on the board. And you have the privilege of adjourning this board. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> You're a winner already, Jay. <laughs> <laughs>